Ready? Welcome to the 2021 Douglas County Noxious Weed Education Workshop. This is our first virtual attempt to do a workshop, so please bear with us. Our agenda this morning will be uh, first off, John Kattelbaum uh, with the Colorado Department of Agriculture Biocontrol. I probably mispronounced his name and I apologize in advance for that. Um, but he will be talking about the biocontrol of leafy spurge, diffuse knapweed, and yellow toad flax. My first encounter with noxious weed biocontrols was in 1982 with the release of uh, the seed head weevil for musk thistle way back in uh, McPherson County, Kansas. And when I moved to Douglas County, we had already, the conservation district had already begun working with the Department of Ag in release of flea beetles and in the release of uh, flies that would uh, hopefully control diffuse knapweed. And we've come a long way since then. So John is a employee of Colorado Department of Agriculture for the last 13 years and the last seven has been at the Palisade and Secretary Biological Control Program. He is um, on the front range operations for Insectary and works mainly in the um, eastern Colorado areas in the front range. The Insectary imports, rears and establishes and colonizes new beneficial organisms for control of specific plants and insect pests and evaluates their effectiveness. He has spent 30 years in, or has 30 years of experience in entomology, including plant pest management and regulation and control. And uh, we've worked closely with him over the last several years and um, look forward to continuing that um, cooperative effort. Thanks, Jonathan, and thank you for the invitation to uh, come to address your workshop. I've done it a few years in the past, and I always enjoy uh, talking about insects and biological control and weeds and all that. So today I'm going to talk about uh, what biocontrol is, uh, CDA, what biocontrol is, what we do with our program, uh, when and why you should use biological control, uh, and then I'll talk about some specific weeds uh, and biocontrol for some specific weeds that uh, Jonathan asked me to talk about. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about how our request a bug program works. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I'm with CDA. I've been with CDA for about 14 years. Uh, the la I've been working with uh, the insectary and biocontrol the whole time, but it's only been the last seven years that I've been full time with biocontrol, and I, I really do love my job. Uh, the biocontrol program is housed uh, in one of the eight divisions of CDA, Conservation Services. Conservation Services has a number of programs, including things that might be relevant to what you do. Um, including noxious weeds and weed-free forage. Um, the biocontrol program is housed out of the Palisade Insectary. Uh, last year was the 75th year of the Insectary. It was started in 1945. We were hoping to have a, a big anniversary celebration. Alas, COVID took that away. Maybe we'll have one coming in the future. Um, it began as a control of Graphilita molesta, which is a pest of peaches and threatened the peach crop in Palisade. And they brought in biocontrol and it worked really well. And uh, it's still going after all this time. Um, we think that it saves uh, peach tree growers several insecticide sprays a year, and you wouldn't have organic peaches um, if it wasn't for this program that we have. Um, and then over the years, uh, the program has developed more uh, biocontrol agents. Uh, and currently we work on about 14 or 15 different pests and have over 20 agents that we work on. Um, our goal is to be a partner in pest management with you, a landowner, 
and other folks. Uh, we work uh, statewide, we work regionally, nationally, and internationally as well. Um, our main mission is to provide biocontrol agents. Uh, they're free when we're first researching them. Um, once we get well-established uh, agents and they work well, we have a request a bug program. Um, we do monitoring of all the introductions, evaluation, whether they work or not, look for non-target effects, and uh, a big part of our job is to educate the public uh, in the use of biocontrol and just to know that they're there, and that's partly why I'm here today. Um, so what is biological control? Uh, it boils down to basically a reunification of a pest with its natural enemies. Um, it's an ecologically based pest control. Um, its goal is suppression, not eradication. Um, what we do at, at the Colorado Department of Ag is mostly classical biological control. Um, most weeds that we have, noxious weeds, are not from around here. They come from other places, other continents. Um, and part of the reason why they're uh, a pest is they've escaped natural predation. Uh, so biological control is going and finding what naturally feeds on those uh, pests and introducing them. Uh, for example, leafy spurge was introduced, in, was found in the 1920s in the United States. It spread across North America, um, and biocontrol for that was initiated in the 90s. Uh, Ephthalina flea beetles were, were uh, brought in in the 80s and 90s, actually. Um, it is, does not involve any genetic modification, or uh, there's no selective breeding. And again, um, the result that we're looking for is suppression of a weed, not uh, necessarily the eradication uh, we're looking to sort of reestablish some balance in, in the nature. Uh, biological control is a safe, effective, inexpensive, and sustainable pest management option. Um, for the safety, um, a, a fairly large study was done uh, recently that looked at um, a bunch of different releases, 512 total releases that where there was good data and uh, over 99% of them had no uh, non-target effects or no um, bad effects. Uh, and the few that did were, uh, the, the effects weren't that great. They were very minor non-population non effects. Um, one of the things that governs biological control is laws and regulations of nations, um, world trade and things like that, but also uh, biocontrol practitioners have a code of best practices, which we like to follow. Um, uh, you want to um, ensure that you're finding a host-specific agent um, and that it meets uh, your needs um, and do a lot of monitoring. And uh, that bottom one there, communicate results to the public, is always important. Um, the steps in getting a weed biocontrol agent are, are very important. Um, it takes about 10 years to do that. Um, but it first starts with identifying your target correctly, things that are feeding on your target overseas, um, and then research and quarantine work to see if it, if it is host specific. Um, and then you have to get a lot of approvals, uh, both uh, uh, from a technical advisory group, a tag group, and the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, part of uh, the USDA, and then also the Fish and Wildlife, and you're worried about uh, economic plants as well as threatened and endangered plants. Um, there's a lot of field testing, including monitoring that are done, and then finally there's a full-scale implementation if everything works well. Um, the insectary is mainly does, does those last things, field testing uh, and uh, implementation. Um, it is safe. There have been, never been any uh, cases in modern weed biocontrol where a biocontrol agent has switched hosts, um, and no biocontrol agents have ever attacked um, crops. Um, there is extensive host range testing for economic crops as well as uh, relatives, congeners, um, and threatened and endangered species as well. So all those, it has to pass all those hurdles before we ever use it. Um, does it work? Is it effective? Um, a, a large study uh, that looked at effectiveness of biocontrol agents and their results um, found that um, at least a third of the introductions led to establishment and a 10% uh, resulted in satisfactory control in terms of uh, no more intervention, uh, no more pesticide sprays, no more uh, human intervention needed anymore that the biocontrol agents uh, took over and worked well. Um, and uh, some of the successes uh, have been uh, subtle, some have been very dramatic, uh, including uh, the first real rangeland weed biocontrol was done um, in the 
1950s for St. John's Wort in Northern California, where uh, the biocontrol works so well, they've established a monument to a beetle, uh, which is probably one of the only places in the world with a monument to a beetle. Um, but it was a, a resounding success. Uh, St. John's Wort was uh, basically, they couldn't uh, let sheep or cattle out on those ranges in Northern California and Oregon. Um, they found a couple uh, flea beetles that they were released, and you can see the before and after photos. And uh, the stock growers and the cattlemen and the stock growers are the ones that put that monument up, uh, thanking the beetle for uh, basically um, saving their livelihood there. Um, to this day, it still provides control. There are outbreaks uh, of St. John's Ward occasionally, but the beetle usually comes back and takes care of it. Uh, so nobody is spraying St. John's Ward, or they shouldn't be. They should be letting the biocontrol agents do the work. Um, a little closer to home here uh, in Pine, Colorado, um, I have an example here of uh, leafy spurge biocontrol that worked really well um, using a combination of uh, aphthona species and oberia stem borers. Um, and we've seen this kind of success in a lot of places. Um, I wasn't around in the late 90s, uh, Jonathan was, but uh, my understanding was that uh, an area like Chatfield State Park was just uh, covered in leafy spurge back then. And, and there's still spurge there. Um, and it occasionally has uh, dense pack, um, dense uh, growth of leafy spurge in places, but the beetles are there uh, and there's really no need to spray. Uh, the beetles keep the uh, spurge pretty much in check there. Um, another example, uh, not of the weeds that we're talking about, but uh, one that's a really good uh, example of success would be uh, uh, after the High Park Fire of 2012, the Hewlett Gulch High Park Fire up uh, outside of Fort Collins, uh, the whole hillsides of areas were uh, dominated by a uh, weed called Dalmatian toad flax. They were just, the hillsides were yellow. Um, about 8,000 beetles were released over two years in 2013 and 2014. And uh, to this day, we have monitoring plots and the uh, stem counts went down by uh, 97%. Um, there's a lot of areas up there where there's just no Dalmatian toad flax. And the Dalmatian toad flax that is there, there are weevils that are present. And um, it is probably going to get into sort of a predator prey cycle where uh, the weed has good years, depending on moisture, seed bank, those kind of things. And the weevils uh, will build up numbers and keep it in, in check. But um, it's something that it's an area where it would be difficult to spray herbicide and you and so it's really good that biocontrol worked well um, it's inexpensive uh, there's for the most part there's the startup costs um, there's basically investment in the uh, research uh, but once you let them go and they they uh, and they are successful they reproduce on their own and spread on their own um, all of them have good uh, benefit cost ratios over one um, and then for something like St. John's Ward, I mean, think of all the years of treatment and rangeland that's saved. It's very, uh, very much uh, worth the investment. Uh, again, uh, I kind of mentioned a little bit sustainable. Um, it's self-propagating. Uh, the agents co-evolve with their weeds, so there's no worries about resistance. Um, and it's a good uh, thing to use um, in an integrated pest management program. Uh, it might reduce uh, pesticide resistance. Uh, Although, if we're talking mostly rangeland weeds here, you're not going to get too much pesticide resistance in rangeland weed spraying. Um, so when should you use biological control? Well, I always think you should consider it if there's agents available in any integrated pest management approach. Um, and it really depends on what your goals are. Um, if, uh, if your goal is eradication, then biocontrol is not for you. It's mostly for su suppression. Um, if the economics are fail favorable and the, those get better, the, the bigger your weed infestation is. Um, and then are there good biocontrol agents available? And for the three weeds I'm going to talk about, um, there's varying uh, degrees of success here. So leafy spurge. Um, this is the first um, weed. This is the first time in a talk I've called it Euphorbia virgata. And actually, I haven't updated our website with that name, but the taxonomists have decided it's no longer Euphorbia asula. It's a different species, and it's always important to, to know exactly what species you are working on, so that's important. Um, but it is uh, a perennial uh, noxious weed. Um, it first arrived uh, 100, 100, almost 200 years ago. Um, it reproduces uh, from seed, and it also reproduces vegetatively through the root system. Um, it's got a, a, a white, milky latex that's uh, uh, irritant to, uh, to people can be and to cattle when they eat it. Um, it can uh, really reduce uh, 
uh, the um, the quality of your range if you have a lot of leafy spurge. If, even if you have a minor amount of leafy spurge, sometimes cattle will refuse to feed in a in a um, in a pasture. Um, we have a couple different biocontrol agents for it. Um, our most successful are the Aphthona flea beetles that Jonathan mentioned earlier. Um, the adults uh, defoliate leaves, uh, but the larvae that feed in the roots are what really do the damage to um, to uh, leafy spurge. Uh, and it's very effective in, in rocky soils and sites that are in full sun. Um, and then the other agent that we sometimes catch and release is a longhorn beetle, uh, Oberia erythrocephala. Um, it's a, a longhorn beetle that uh, lays its eggs in the stems and the, um, it, the larvae um, eat through the stem and kill uh, individual plants and reduce seed set. And uh, those agents are available um, usually around mid, uh, mid to late June through July. Uh, I got a few nice bug photos here. Here's some different Aphthona, flea spe uh, Aphthona species. Um, here's some, uh, some better. Those are about three millimeters long, those, those insects. They're very small. Um, the Aphthona nigriscutus is probably the most abundant uh, Aphthona species that we find, uh, but we usually can find all four in places. Um, I would say the Aphthona lacertosa, the one up on the upper right, uh, is found more in sort of riparian, wetter areas. Uh, the Aphthona nigriscutus is found in more um, sort of uh, dry land areas. Um, I have a project that I'm working with some folks up in the Yampa River area. Um, in 2011, they had a really severe uh, flood, and it took a lot of spurge down into the Dinosaur National Monument, where it really hadn't been before. Um, and so uh, going up river to control the leafy spurge in Route and Moffat counties has been very important to the folks at the Dinosaur National Monument. Um, a whole bunch of folks have volunteered on this project. And what we found is that uh, historical leafy, leafy spurge biocontrol sites hadn't really been visited. Um, and so we have uh, folks that are going back and checking those out. And the results have been kind of surprising. Uh, beetles are still persistent after some places after 25 years of release. Um, and it appears like the, the beetles and, uh, and the oberia, the longhorn beetle, are keeping the leafy spurge in check and could use just some a little bit of assistance with uh, collection and re-release. Um, I point out that uh, we have a really nice little guide to uh, identify aphthona species um, at that site. Uh, so Yampa River Leafy Spurge Project com. And uh, if you click on the resources tab, there's a YRLSP biological control species ID guide. And then you can see that on the right um, helps you identify the beetles. So uh, that's a fun little project we're doing. I, I'm kind of thinking that, um, that our neck of the woods, we could maybe try and uh, duplicate those efforts because it's kind of an interesting project. Um, if you were to dig up uh, the plants and look at the roots, you could find a larva that looks like that. Um, that would be harder to do. Um, one of the things with Aphthona that a lot of people notice is the, the beetle bomb. And so that's where you release the beetles and the next year you can come back and you can obviously see results. Um, uh, and then they really like the edges of leafy spurge patches. So there's an example of the before and after photo. Uh, and then here's some better photos of the, um, the longhorn beetle, the oberia, um, which we can find around as well. Uh, and there's the larva that um, feeds down through the stem and gets into the root ground. Um, here's a release map of sort of historical release information uh, that we have for the last, uh, I don't know, 15 years or so. And you can see that the releases uh, correspond with where leafy spurge is still pretty much a problem in the, in the, in the, um, in the state. Um, this is uh, the release map for last year and where we were. You can see there's quite a bit there in Douglas County. Um, especially going out, out towards Elbert County there. That's a, a hot spot. Um, I have a theory that there's a lot of horse properties out there. They may not be getting um, uh, weed-free uh, hay. Um, so if you're in Douglas County and you're buying hay, uh, try and get weed-free hay. That's available. Um, and then here's what it looks like when we release some, either in a container or in a bakery bag, and you just put them out in one spot and let them do their thing. Um, Another uh, weed that uh, Jonathan asked me to talk about, which I know you have a lot of in Douglas County, is diffuse knapweed. Um, diffuse and spotted, spotted knapweed are very uh, similar to each other. Um, they're both um, asters native to Eurasia. Um, uh, these don't; uh, these only produce, um, reproduce by seed, though. Uh, 
as opposed to uh, through rhizomes. A nice little tumbleweed. Um, the difference uh, for diffuse map, napweed, uh, mostly white flowers um, and flower uh, July to August. Um, you might have some spotted napweed around here. I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, I know there's some in Elbert County that I've found. I think that might be the nearest to you. Um, and we have a couple different biocontrol agents that we collect and re-release on uh, these weeds. Uh, Larinus minutus is a lesser napweed flower weevil, and Cyphocleonus acades is a napweed root weevil. Um, the flower weevil uh, is a, likes diffuse napweed better than spotted. It feeds on the seed heads, um, open flowers. It also feeds on the rosettes, which is important for the biocontrol. Um, it lays its eggs uh, deep in the flower head, and uh, the larvae eat out all the seeds. Um, the root weevil uh, feeds in the roots, as it says. Um, it's a little uh, bigger of a weevil. It's more like a pinto bean, kind of. Um, and it can really reduce and kill napweed plants as well. Um, here's a, a shot of a napweed with some uh, uh, Larinus minutus on it. Can you see those on the flower heads? If not, I circled them. Um, uh, so a lot in, in July and August, you can go out and find uh, beetles out on your diffuse napweed. If they're there, that's good. If not, uh, you can give us a call and we'll get you some. Um, there's a weevil inside of an empty seed head. Um, that's what you'd like to see. Um, and then you'll see a lot, this a lot with the skeletons of diffuse napweed. Um, uh, holes where um, uh, the larvae have eaten out all the seed heads. So you could look for that in your diffuse napweed as well. Um, here's a, a big, healthy, diffuse napweed rosette. Um, I said that was important for those adults to come out. They overwinter as adults, and they come out and they feed on those in the spring, and that's a, an important part of diffuse napweed biocontrol. Uh, and there's a nice shot of the big uh, pinto bean sort of looking uh, sifo for spotted napweed. Uh, toad flax. Uh, uh, the next one that Jonathan asked me to talk about was uh, toad flax. There's a couple different toad flaxes. I think you have more yellow in Douglas County than, than uh, Dalmatian. Dalmatian's uh, quite a bit in Jefferson County, Boulder, up into Larimer County. Um, uh, they're a little different than the leaves on yellow to, uh, toad flax or narrow. Actually, the, um, the growing plants sometimes can be confused a little bit with leafy spurge uh, when they're first coming out of the ground. Uh, the uh, main way to tell the difference would be to break off a little bit of the plant. If it has the milky latex, it's uh, leafy spurge. Um, if it doesn't, it's uh, yellow toad flax. Um, the leaves are narrow and pointed on yellow toad flax as opposed to a heart-shaped and wider clasping leaf of the Dalmatian toad flax. Um, there's some good photos of it. Um, <laughs> the literature all says it's called butter and eggs, or people call it that. I've never heard anybody call it that, but I, I can see why. Uh, it's a very pretty flower. It is an uh, escaped perennial. Um, I think at one point we looked at uh, our noxious weeds in Colorado, and we found that 66% uh, of them were escaped ornamentals, and this happens to be one of them. Um, it, uh, it definitely likes the foothills, prairie, and gets up into the mountains as well. Um, our agent for that, uh, it's uh, Messinus janthinus. It's a, um, it's a weevil. Uh, the weevil lays its eggs uh, in the stem, and a lot of larva uh, fit in stems. We'll, uh, where we get good toad flax uh, weevil numbers, we'll pull a stem up and dissect it and can have 20 to 40 larvae inside one stem. Um, this is established in Colorado. Um, there's two different, there's Messinus janthinus, which is for yellow toad flax, and Messinus janthiniformis, that's for Dalmatian toad flax. Um, the Dalmatian toad flax one is working really well for us. Uh, this Janthinus one is, is not working quite as well. It's worked, it's taken longer at some places, it took, took a little longer to get established, uh, but we finally do have it established in a few places and it's looking promising. Uh, Montana kind of has the opposite. They have really good luck with this yellow toad flax weevil um, and the, their Dalmatian toad flax weevil isn't quite as effective. Uh, I'm not sure why those are, but we're doing a phenology study. We're studying the, uh, the development and growth of yellow toad flax and the weevils. Uh, hopefully that'll help us elucidate why some of these things aren't quite working well and give us some management options. Um, the uh, one interesting thing about these weevils is that they overwinter as adults in the stem of the plant, um, which uh, helps us collect. We can collect stems in the fall, and that's a really good way to collect them. Um, so they lay their eggs. The larvae um, feed in the stems, and um, 
and uh, they pupate in the stems and then like the adults stay in the stems through the fall. Uh, so here's our releases. You can see not, compared to Aphthona, not very many releases. Um, but a few of them have been here in Douglas County and we have a few uh, test plots we're working on here. Uh, and then I got some cool pictures of small little weevils. They're only about uh, three millimeters long as well, maybe four at the longest. They're little tiny grains of rice. Um, so uh, how do you get biocontrols? Well, the best way to do it is to Google Palisade Insectary. Uh, you could also look for Colorado Department of Ag, but the Palisade Insectary is the best. And we have a request a bug, a request a bug program that where we sell some of these agents. And you can see the prices are there and their availability. Uh, you can also call us toll free at 866-324-2963. Uh, but really, most of our uh, orders are now coming through online. Uh, there's a nice little request a bug form. You put in your information, uh, click which weeds you have. Um, and this year, for the first time, we're going to have credit card payments. So before it's all been in checks, uh, but now we're going to be able to take credit cards this year. So we're pretty excited about that. And I got to thank my colleagues at the Palisade Insectary because they do a lot of the work that I can talk about, uh, including Dr. Bean, who's the director. Um, if you're really interested in toad flax, uh, Mike Reset is our uh, toad flax program manager, and that his email address is right there. Um, and then uh, our program wouldn't exist and work well without our federal, state, uh, county, and municipal uh, collaborators. So I want to thank them. And that's it. And are we taking questions or how are we doing that? You gonna take questions? Okay. How do I do that? Okay. If you have a question for John, uh, you can raise your hand if you're attending on WebEx. The hand raising option is down in your bottom right corner. You can also place your questions in the chat and I will be able to read them to John uh, directly. So please raise your hand if you have a question, and then I will call on you when it's time to speak. I have a question here from Gretchen. I have a low growing spurge around my patio. How should I handle that? Leafy spurge, or is it, there's different spurges. So um, I guess, uh, what's the really nasty one? Myrtle spurge. Uh, if it's low growing, it might be myrtle spurge, which uh, is, will really burn your skin if you get that latex on you. So if you're gonna pull, uh, Myrtle spurge, you definitely want to wear gloves, glasses, long sleeves, um, and, be, and you want to get rid of that because it can spread. But um, if it's just a, a small amount of spurge, um, you know, dig it up would be my, I wouldn't do biocontrol for a small amount of leafy. It depends on how much you got, but I, I would dig it up probably. Here's a question from Elaine. Do these bugs need to be repopulated each year? Um, we sometimes yes. Uh, if they don't establish at first, um, I anecdotally um, for for the aphthona and leafy spurge, I have customers like some years it's a biocontrol agent. So uh, depending on the whims of nature, sometimes collection isn't great. Um, we either miss it or it's just a bad year for the beetles, and so we don't get shipments out to people. And people have said that uh, they put out releases every year and it really keeps leafy spurge at bay. Um, the years that we haven't been able to provide beetles, the spurge has spread a bit. So um, for some places, they might not overwinter um, and they might need to be supplemented or augmented um, with, a, with an additional release. So that can be uh, the case. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Another question, this one from Christy. Are there any weed predators for Russian thistle that would be harmful to the rest of my five acres in Castle Pines? Um, there have been a couple biocontrol agents that have been released for Russian thistle, but none of them were really effective. Um, so there's nothing available right now. Um, I don't know if I've ever really seen anything feeding on Russian thistle. Um, 
there has been a, a plant pathogen identified, which would be really promising, but it's got to get through some of the regulatory hurdles and approvals. Um, and so that's, that's a number of years down the line. Hey, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question here from Steve. What size areas are best for biocontrol? Oh boy, that's a tough question. That's actually one of the harder questions that we get. Like how many releases should we do? So sometimes releases are kind of limited. So my suggestion would always be to try them out uh, one or two releases on a small area uh, where you can monitor them, get back to it and check them out. Um, if that seems to work for you and you need more releases in future years, go for that. Um, Biocontrol is definitely something that requires patience. You're not going to necessarily, that, that beetle bomb is, is the exception. You're not going to see results like that year over uh, the next year, typically. We're talking a three to five year process, sometimes 20 years. There's a ranch in Douglas County, and those folks I talked to, um, they got rid of all their knapweed, and then it comes back. And what they found over 20 years of working with the beetles is to have a little reserve of, of, of beetles around really helps keep their knapweed in check. Um, they weren't able to eradicate knapweed from their property, but having the beetles around really helps. So I don't know if that really answers. I'm sorry, that doesn't really answer your question. Um, uh, it depends on how big your infestation is, I guess. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan's rule of thumb, one acre or more. And I, that's probably good. If you're less than an acre, uh, there's probably other uh, methods uh, and eradication might really be what you want to look at, which would be an herbicide or mechanical option, um, depending on what you want. Um, I did want to say, I get a lot of people asking me before somebody even asks about mowing. Um, and I, I'm not sure mowing, especially diffuse knapweed is a good idea. I really, I don't know. I think Dr. Beck uh, talks about that too. I don't know if he'll be on to answer questions, but um, you could create more problems by mowing than not, so. Is that it? All right, thank you, John. Any right. last uh, call for questions? All right, I'm seeing no more questions. If you do come up with some more questions that you'd like for John, you can email them to jreif at douglas.co.us. I will put that email address in the chat. Or you can email me right there too. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, John. Next up, we will have a, a, a video presentation by Dr. George Beck, retired CSU professor in bio, biosciences. Uh, he was a weed science professor and, and did uh, many years of, of service for the state of Colorado and pasture range and non-crop noxious weed management. And uh, he will specifically talk about noxious weeds in the front range and he was a co-author with the uh, many others of the western states in, in the book weed control in natural areas in the western united states uh, and with that we will uh, switch over to his video presentation we are ready to play the video I'm going to talk one the next hour about some common bee list noxious weeds in, in, uh, along the front range in Colorado and how to control them. But first, I'd like to get some principles, uh, fundamental principles uh, up and forward, because I'm going to talk about primarily using herbicides to create the opportunity from a land management uh, perspective to deal with the problems. Weeds respond positively to disturbance. They're opportunistic plants, ruderal plants ecologically, and they have a dozen to up to 20 or so character, biological characteristics that they share that we have noticed over time as human beings. And, and so the issue of what happens during a disturbance is quite varied. It can be subtle, it can be dramatic, but 
The big one from a weed management perspective is that when plants die, they leach out their nutrients into the soil, but especially nitrate nitrogen seems to be a driver of opportunity for these plants and weeds respond positively to increase nitrate nitrogen in the soil. So that's kind of a nutshell approach to what happens and why weeds uh, do what they do. Uh, secondary succession is, a, is an the outcome of uh, weed, weeds and disturbance. There have to be available sites and the disturbance provides that just so the plants have a place to live regardless of whether they're a weed or a desirable one. And the species that are available at that site uh, can uh, be controlled by the land manager to no small degree. Sometimes all the propagules are present with them seeds or vegetative propagules but you also may have to introduce seeds of the desirable plant community if necessary. And this is kind of as you go management. Uh, the available species, whether you, you influence that or just living with what's out there, uh, performs differently as climatic conditions in particular change. And of course, in our state, soil moisture is probably the biggest driver of that event. So one thing that all weed management has in, comp is in common is competition from desirable species is the keystone for successful weed management. Without it, it's, you're just fighting yourself. Bare ground is about the only place where you're not worried about competition. You actually want to eliminate that. But using herbicide, for example, to control weeds either kills or suppresses those plants and the weed growth there then is below some th uh, threshold of impact. The weeds use fewer resources, which then become available for the desirable members of the plant community to use as they occupy the state uh, the, the, the uh, sites. These are the tenants of IPM or successional weed management. So with that in mind, I'll spring forward and get right into my presentation on weed control. I'm gonna start off with diffuse and spotted knapweed, some old foes we have along the front range here. Uh, we've had diffuse knapweed for a long time, spotted's catching up, unfortunately. So Centauri diffuse is a member of the sunflower family. It's a semiparous perennial, a term I think somebody made up because you can't find it in a dictionary but it means it lives for an unspecified period of time. So the majority of the plants behave as perennial, sometimes they're annual or even biennial, but they spread only from seed. And as most of you folks are, are, are familiar with it, the shoots break off and tumble with the wind, which is an outstanding mechanism to move seed across the landscape. Um, it's a huge problem along the front range. Uh, we have a very wonderful habitat for it. All the knapweeds evolve with the receding glaciers in Europe and Asia, and boy, you look at, at the Great Plains and that's exactly what happened here too. So they're right at home. Now here's a map. I chose to use the Ed maps because our, we don't really have any decent state maps and the ones I have are not up to date. So the Ed maps is a really good program. I think Colorado's participating in it, um, but you can see diffuse knapweed is a huge problem throughout the Western US and we have almost all of our counties have some degree of diffuse knapweed. Uh, Centauri stobia spotted knapweed, and it's a perennial, can live up to about nine years old um, or so. It produces upwards of 40,000 seeds per square meter during moist years. It tends to occupy more mesic regions of the, uh, of the U.S. and plus in its home countries. Um, <clears throat> the seeds germinate in spring or fall. Uh, unlike diffuse knapweed, which has typically just one shoot, unless it gets broken off, then it might have two. Spotted knapweed may produce a, you know, half a dozen shoots or more. If you look at the photograph on the bottom, wrap, uh, bottom right, it's an old spotted knapweed rosette. And you can see all the previous year's shoots. So it, it can be a pretty robust plant. It's native to Central Europe and east to Central Russia, the Caucasian region, which is very similar to Colorado and Western Siberia. And in those locations, it's most aggressive on this forest grassland interface. In fact, that's where it seems to be the biggest problem for us here in North America, possibly with the Southwest Colorado being um, an exception to that. So it's expanding its range, if you will. So an um, map of, uh, of spotted knapweed is very well distributed in the West. Uh, and you can see mostly a North, the Northern tier of states. I have a good friend uh, that used to teach at the University of Minnesota and I'd go up, uh, he used to be the, uh, 
the director of Itasca, which is an experiment station way up north, and they were just starting to get knapweed up there. And of course, those are all glaciated soils, and it just went nuts. In just a few years, it, the place was covered. And of course, they twiddled their thumbs trying to figure out what to do. And before they know it, everywhere they looked, they had spotted knapweed. Uh, so it's a formidable plant to deal with. A young spotted knapweed rosette, of course, this is a good size to target. Unfortunately, it's small enough that it goes unseen. These older plants are typically more of what we're, what we're looking at as far as uh, herbicide use and, and even biological control from that standpoint. But uh, they're very, they grow similarly, uh, that is the fusion spotted knapweed. Um, but you can tell the two apart pretty easily once it gets to the flowering growth stage. The few snap weed on the left, this specimen has a white flower, but it can also have the lavender flowers as well. But the way you tell the two species and all the thistles and snap weeds apart is by their bracts. And as you can see on the few snap weed, the central bract has got a sharp spine on it, and it's uncomfortable to handle that. And you can see fringe on the side of the, of the bract, kind of like teeth on a comb. Somewhat similar on spotted knapweed, it has a black tip though, and it doesn't really have that long reflexing central spine. So they're fairly easy to tell apart. Um, otherwise, they're, they have roughly the same size head and the flower color can be the same or different. Now, as far as managing with herbicides, aminopyrrolate is one of the best. Our new product is whetstone. And seven fluid ounces per acre, uh, the optimum timing is bolting through the fall. Uh, so we have an extended period of time in which you can you can use the product. Now, I would avoid the month of July in our state. It's usually hot and dry. The Palmer Divide is kind of an exception to that. Uh, oftentimes, they can have showers every day. So you have a little bit more latitude with, with regard to uh, timing. Uh, Picloram or Triumph 22K is still one of the standards at a pint per acre from rosettes, either in the spring or fall. Uh, that works exceptionally well. Uh, those two have a lots of soil activity, so you have residual in the soil to catch germinating seedlings that might occur after treatment. Now, Cloperolet, our product being Sonora, uh, you apply it two thirds to one pint per acre, and again, targeting the rosettes in spring or fall. It doesn't have a lot of displayed soil activity for uh, spotted or diffuse snapweed, and I say displayed because it seems to be species oriented. And this is one of the things that came out of Joe DiTomaso's book in California, um, was the learning lesson. I'm old enough, I can get away with this. I learned it, it, you know, a herbicide either had soil activity or it didn't, it didn't depend so much on plant species, much less location. At any rate, uh, we have this common cast of characters you'll see again uh, for you know, almost all the thistles and knapweed. Uh, my next weed to talk about is Russian knapweed. Uh, it's one of my personal favorites. It's a huge problem in our state, uh, all over the Intermountain West, but even on the Great Plains. It's hard pressed to make much progress on the Great Plains because it's so dry, um, but we have a significant amount of the problem here in Colorado. It's another member of the sunflower family as a creeping herbaceous perennial, um, and it reproduces then from both the roots and the seed, seed stock. Seed, it produces a lot of seed, not always is it viable, and it's only viable in soil for two or three years. So the primary mechanism of spread is through the rhizomes and, and such. Now, the, uh, there's a brown to black scaly appearance uh, on the crowns and the roots, the roots you're not gonna be able to see at 75 miles an hour going down the interstate. But this is available to you as a, as a, a land manager to examine 12 months out of the year. So it's pretty easy to tell, say, from Canada thistle, even during the winter, winter months. Uh, Russian knapweed is allelopathic, and it may form monocultures. We see this, and the monocultures are most expressed in heavy clay soils. It is toxic to horses. Uh, it and yellow star thistle were the plants that were sampled. I actually had a grad student buddy that ran an experiment, and it produces what we call as a chewing disease. It's very sad to see. Uh, the 25 cent term is nigropalatal encephalomalacia. I'm surprised I can't, I can say that without tripping over my tongue, but it's fatal to the horse. Uh, and they literally, uh, literally starve to death or, or die of dehydration over a period of six weeks. And there's no, no recovery from it to my knowledge. Uh, it gets the land, landowners going though. I mean, we, I used to use this, maybe I'm a little evil there, but the pencils that start moving uh, when they found out about plant that's as toxic to their love, their beloved animals is, is Russian knapweed. Typically, they won't eat it, thankfully, because it tastes terrible. 
uh, very widespread through the western United States, then a few places in the east, but it, it tends to like the drier climates. <clears throat> now, this is key. This is a slide from one year. We did a study for about five years when I was at CSU. The two lines to pay attention here are the, are the blue line, which is soil temperature, and the red line, which is the number of uh, root buds that we found on a, well, about 10 centimeter long section of crown and roots. And we would go out once a week. That like Gavily said this for, we did this for five years. Of course, I said my students, everyone knows professors don't work anyway. But what you can see in this particular year, we had a peak uh, root bud activity, their growth that is in the month of January. So this is why we think the uh, winter treatments, fall treatments work so well, is because the root system is metabolically very active and becomes a strong sink then for herbicides. And that's an hypothesis, but it seems to bear fruit uh, with regard to our experience managing it. So this, this uh, you can see the black, the brown scaly appearance on the crown just below my fingers there in a little white root bud. This is dug up in, in December. So this plant we hadn't quite uh, has gone as crazy as some of the other specimens that we had. And then oh, a few months later in March, those root buds start to grow as the soil warms up a bit. One of them surfaces and the other ones typically slough off. You'll only get one of them uh, that survives. And the root system and the crowns are pretty much vacant of their ability to reproduce vegetatively from that point until, this, until that cycle starts again in late August, uh, in, in the late summer and the fall of the year. Now, in the, just as soon as it starts to emerge, it almost bolts instantly. It's a little like Canada thistle from that standpoint. This is not a good growth stage to use herbicides to control uh, Russian knapweed. Typically, you don't see activity on that patch until the following fall when that root bud cycle starts again. It's very interesting. We saw this in a couple of our experiments. But nonetheless, shortly thereafter, when all of these root buds are up and growing uh, as, as, uh, as shoots is when you want to start the spring cycle. Uh, Russian knapweed flowers are pretty distinct. They're much different, of course, than the diffuse and spotted knapweed. They're a little bit larger often have or typically have this lavender type color, but they can also have a white flower. And the bracts are very smooth, papery, thin. And that's one way you can, you can tell them apart. Now, as far as control, uh, whetstone works exceptionally well at five to seven fluid ounces per acre. We always found it here in Colorado work best, best with the fall application, again, owing to that root bud cycle that I shared with you. The Russian knapweed appears dead and dormant, and how does it work? Well, it's taking it up through the root system. Um, the, there's also a timing that people have found that the bud to flower in the summertime works as well. Uh, and uh, again, the July is not a good time for applying any herbicide, particularly if it's droughty. So that's why we started looking at the fall application timing. Uh, Triumph 22K or Picram is still one of the standards, a quart per acre or almost any time during the growing season, not when it first emerges though, it doesn't work well then. Uh, but again, late fall is when we had the greatest success. Now you can spot spray that Picram at two quarts per acre, but typically you're, you're uh, dealing with a much larger uh, problem. Uh, Triumph 22K plus 24D is another good one that expands the uh, spectrum of activity with a little 24D. But again, the fall is the best timing application. Now, Clopyrolid, our product being Sonora, also works very, very well on Russian knapweed. The fall, now this is the one that's confusing because you got plants that look like the photograph and the right is how is that taking up foliarly? Well, I don't have an answer for that one to be perfectly honest, but it's rapidly growing in the spring, say, you know, in the end of May, 1st of June, it works well also, but the fall is still seemingly the best, but that's a puzzle. Now, chlorsulfuron has a lot of soil activity, so it makes more sense, and it only works well in the fall. So particularly along the front range, you're looking sometime in October or November, even in early December, uh, obviously not when the soil is frozen, uh, for your best application timing. And it takes one ounce of chlorosulfuron to work well. Canada thistle is the next weed of, of uh, interest. And at this growth stage right now, all you weed supervisors know that this is the problem because this telephone starts ringing and my neighbor is letting all of his Canada thistle go to seed and it's getting into my yard, blah, 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 blah. 
Uh, it's a good vehicle for getting a group participation. All right, Circio marvensis is another creeping herbaceous perennial reproducing both from seeds and roots. Produces about 1,200 seed per flowering shoot. Viable in the soil around 20 years or so. So every time you let it go to seed, you give some bad luck for the next couple of decades. Uh, we know that plants are produced in very small root pieces as evidenced by if you try to plow this stuff to kill it, you just spread it all over the field. Makes for a very nice research site, but it's very hard to raise a crop under those circumstances, even hay. The <clears throat> photograph of the rosettes when they're first coming in the, up in the spring, uh, the plants start to bolt almost immediately because the 14 hours of day length triggers the flowering cycle, which is just about the time when it first comes up in late March or early, early April, depending on the year and the amount of soil moisture we have available. And then very shortly thereafter, the bolting process starts and we get into the flowering growth stage. And one thing nice about Canada thistle, if there is anything nice at all, is it's easy to detect zipping down the road doing your weed surveys because it'll have multiple flower heads where most of our native thistles just have one flower head. Uh, and so you can distinguish that very quickly. Most of us are familiar with this particular plant. The flower color can be that lavender. Uh, it, there's even apparently some blue biotypes out there. I've never seen them, but very often too, it can be white and you can have a mixture. Now there's probably two different clones mixed together uh, in a particular stand, but uh, it's, it's quite a handsome plant for some people until I go up and try to touch it and love it because it, it bites pretty hard because of the spines. And again, this is the Canada thistle Ono or Aji's growth stage, depending on what part of the country you're from. And true enough, you get a lot of seed that's scattered with the pappus, but the data show that most of the seed falls around the parent shoot. So that's the good news, but the bad news, it's a very successful plant. So this mechanism of spread uh, is quite significant. Now, uh, Dr. Phil Wester, oh, he's the one that really ran these experiments, uh, had his students uh, dig up 24 of these uh, ramets. You can see this is a shoot coming off of the root system. So this is an adventitious shoot, uh, just about ready to uh, uh, burst through the soil uh, in the early parts of the spring, you know, typically is sometime mid-March to the first parts of April. We put those in a, a big box, artificial to be sure, a little warmer soil temperature. We, we watered them, we sung Kumbaya to them. And then after 14 months, we pulled that chain off in the, in the front boards and washed the soil off. And most of you have seen this, but it's worth, it's worth the journey again. So are you ready for this? Look at that root system. Phil said they, they had over 3,000 feet of roots that grew over a period of 14 months out of 24 of those ramets. That's spectacular at, 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 at a minimum. So this is why this plant is so difficult to control. It's just a bear cat. It occupies all of the soil. It can be just a hog. Fortunately, it doesn't occupy dry soils as well as moist soils, or we'd have a bigger problem. In Colorado than we have. Because this is a thistle, you got the same group of herbicides, the oxins that uh, work very well. Aminopyrrolid and whetstone at five to seven fluid ounces uh, per acre works very well. You see a rate range like this. I try to stress that always start at the higher range. Um, it just works better and we don't see much resistance um, from in, in perennial weeds but when you apply at too low a rate, you're actually selecting for resistance as well. But again, a perennial is not as serious an issue uh, as, as annuals. Um, the best timing to the spring at flowering are again, fall. Now fall is earlier than you would say with Russian nap, we treat with, uh, in fall earlier than Russian nap would be, be treated. Uh, but nonetheless, fall is a really good time for Canada thistle as well. You can use uh, whetstone uh, in uh, riparian areas. So where the soil is moist, it really loves those sites. Whereas something like Triumph 22K or Picram, you can't use it there. So the uh, amino pyrrolid molecule lends itself to a broader area where the problem exists. Uh, Triumph at one quart per acre works exceptionally well, uh, almost any time uh, once it starts to emerge. And because both those herbicides have such a great amount of soil activity, they continue to work on seedlings that germinate after the ramets come up. Uh, dicamba 4 or dicamba, we always found that two quarts per acre in the fall provided for the most consistent control and a year after treatment, 
this is somewhere between 70 and 80% control on the average. The dicamba plus 2,4-D, I don't think works as well as dicamba alone because you don't have enough dicamba when you mix the two together. Now, Sonora or clopyrrolid uh, works exceptionally well on, on uh, Canada thistle. It's a very selective molecule, so you can, you can uh, clean up the Canada thistle and have a burst of all kinds of stuff come through there, including Forbes. Uh, one pint per acre in the fall is excellent, or two thirds to one pint in the spring. You just gotta make sure all the ramets are up because of its lack of apparent soil activity on Canada thistle. Again, that varies a little bit. Now, this is one of my favorite plants of all time, Scotch thistle, and it just, you know, it evolved in uh, Northern Great Britain, Northern U United Kingdom. And as you can see in the back there, it looks like there's this huge stand of, can of uh, Scotch thistle uh, growing in a line, and it actually is. That's an irrigation canal, and I'll address that in just a moment, but this is a pretty big plant here. It's almost 10 feet tall. We have two onoportum species in Colorado, but only onoportum acanthium is important to us, although both of them are noxious. It is the predominant species. It has pubescent or hairy leaves uh, and hairy stems on both sides of the leaves. The onoportum taricum or tarian thistle is glabrous. It has no hairs on the tops of the leaves, but it's very hairy on, on the underneath side. They're both biennials and then reproduce only from seed. Uh, the, we have data on the Scotch thistle knowing that it, it produces about 30,000 seeds per plant. And obviously that's going to occur in a moisture, a high moisture year. And it's viable for more than 39 years. And that's a weird number because most of these soil uh, seed reserves experiments have been designed to be harvested at five or 10, 10 year intervals. Well, this was part of what's called the Duval seed experiment. A seed burial experiment was done at one of the Virginia universities, started in 1902 and terminated in 1942 uh, due to the World War II uh, occurring and the, and the military taking over that part of the university's property. So it knocks like days, they say 39 years, and that's the weirdness associated with that. Now back to the why the, the, the Scotch thistle grows on these waterways or adjacent to the waterways is because it has a water soluble germination inhibitor in the seed coat. And this keeps the plant from germinating precociously, if you will, and dying if there's no, no soil moisture. So all it needs is a little moisture and it can take off. And then, then it can occupy very dry habitat. Um, I elk hunt in Northwest Colorado with Gary Brandon, some of you guys may know him. And it's very, distracted if not distraught this year at the expanse of scotch thistle up there. They've had a few decent moisture springs and so that's key and since that time they've it is scattered all over uh, uh, the northern parts of Moffat County where we hunt. It's just absolutely terrible, shocking. All right so this is a photograph of uh, scotch thistle seedlings and they're pretty distinct. They got a, a very visible midrib and the leaves are even starting to twist a little bit, as you'll see in these older juveniles. This, this was taken, photograph was taken the year these plants came up. Um, and so this is pretty typical. This is actually a good growth stage to be used in a herbicide. We tend to get it to the second year. So you can see last year's uh, dead leaves and then all that cottony pubescence is a distinct barrier to herbicide absorption. So that has to be dealt with either with a non-ionic surfactant or even a methylated seed oil. When it flowers, it's a pretty spectacular plant from, being, from its size. This specimen is about seven feet tall. Um, and notice what it's, it's growing with, a bunch of cheat grass and other junk. Um, I, I've, I'm one of my nicknames for this is elephant ear thistle. Those, those leaves are about two and a half feet long. They're just a tremendous uh, size plant. I spoke about Moffat County's uh, a scotch thistle, it gets tall up there, but the flowers are small and the leaves are small because over the growing season, it's just so dry. But it's, it, all it needs is that spring moisture and it's off, off to the races. Now comparing the two different species of scotch thistle, if you will, uh, on a point of macanthium on the left, you can see the pubescence grows right up to the, uh, to the flower heads, but the tarian thistle on the right you can see that it's devoid of those that cotton and pubescence, except on the underneath side. And there's some small differences between the two uh, flowers 
and these are distinguished by the different ways and the different color that the bracts are. Now, a map, an ed map of both, you can see Scotch thistle is a bigger problem throughout the western U.S., including here in Colorado. We have one spot down by Rye, and I remember the first time I saw it, I was going, well, that's the weirdest Scotch thistle I've ever seen. Well, I found out a few years later, it wasn't Scotch thistle at all, it was Tarian thistle. Uh, apparently a problem in some places in California, I listened to Jody Tomaso talk about it uh, at one of the Western Society of Weed Science meetings. Now, musk thistle is a common problem along the front range. We have quite a bit of it. It does exceptionally well uh, on, on the Great Plains and clear into the Eastern United States. It's another member of the sunflower family. We have a couple of species. Uh, depending who you talk to, they think there's maybe one, could be two, Carduus nutans, or Carduus macrocephalus, it wouldn't matter, they're, they're noxious in Colorado. Uh, they're, they're biennial plants reproducing only from seed. The soil seed reserve is about 10 years. They tend to uh, emerge in spring or fall. Uh, sometimes the fall emergers, particularly out on the plains, behave as annuals rather than biennials. Any plant that only sends its information and forward in time and space by seed, the key to its management is to prevent seed formation. That'll become important in just a minute. Uh, a photograph of uh, two different, probably could be age. The one on the left could be a second year. The one on the right could be a first year rosette, although it, it looks a little bit like it's starting to bolt. So it could just be a, a size issue when it germinated that year. But a couple of distinctions here uh, on Scott's, or excuse me, on musk thistle, the, you can see the edges of the leaves look like they have kind of a frost on them. And then the, the very distinct yellowish, creamy yellowish uh, midrib uh, allows you to determine that this is indeed musk thistle. Uh, one way you can tell musk thistle from plumeless thistle, which typically is a bigger problem in the mountains, that, that musk thistle, at least on the terminal blooms, has almost no, no leaves on the stem, as you can see in this particular photograph. And that's an easy way to tell the two apart. Otherwise, they're quite different. They, they behave. Um, similarly in the form of uh, in how you would manage them. Uh, my technician, Jim Sebastian, worked with me for 28, 29 years. He now is with Boulder Open Space. They're very fortunate to have him. Jim is uh, an extraordinary worker. He took this photograph. If I'd have taken it, it'd all been blurry like the back, but it's, we've got a lot of mileage out of it. But an outstanding representation of a, a typical musk thistle seed head probably two to three inches in diameter and great big sharp bracts. Most of us at one time or another in moments of stupidity have tried to handle that without gloves on and it's, it's a very difficult chore. As far as control, similar herbicides, again, amino pyrrolid, uh, whetstone for scotch thistle is five to seven fluid ounces per acre. And I definitely lean up to the higher end uh, for scotch thistle because it's much more difficult to control than musk. Uh, musk thistles, three to five fluid ounces. Triumph 22K is very reasonable at half a pint, three quarters of a pint per acre. Again, rosettes are the, are the target in spring or fall, but notice with whetstone, it's bolting. Got to let it bolt, uh, rosette to bolting in the spring of the year, excuse me, uh, or fall. So on the right hand, the upper right hand photograph, I tried to find some that were in that early bolting growth stage. That's a great timing for either one, either whetstone or triumph. Um, and then, of course, on the right, the lower right is uh, musk thistle in a rosette growth stage, and that's the best timing for probably most herbicides. Um, dicamba, we never could get it to work well on Scotch thistle, so typically I restrict my recommendations to musk thistle with two pints per acre in the spring or fall. And this is where dicamba plus 2,4-D does shine very well. Just got to make sure it's in that rosette growth stage or it can still set viable seeds, but one plus two pints per acre in the rosette stage, spring or fall, works very well on musk thistle. Now, one of the things I remember I used to smell, figuring it was dicamba plus 2,4-D or just dicamba, was spraying of musk thistle in this growth stage. And it's like, if that plant had a tongue, it would stick it out at you and, and giggle. Um, because it's going to set viable seed. Yeah, you'll kill the plant, but there's seed that will be passed f uh, forward in time, and so it wins the battle, if you will. So this is a poor growth stage to use auxinic herbicides to control musk thistle. We did a study with DuPont a long, long time ago and published it, where we found that the sulfonylureas like chlorosulfurin, which I think is the best choice, 
uh, prevented, it eliminated viable seed formation if you had the, the application timing correct. And that was from bolting to very, very early bud growth stage as I tried to show in these two photographs on the right. Uh, with the bolting uh, muscles that were very robust plant or specimen, uh, or down in the lower right, it's just starting to get flowers formed. We found that there would be no viable seed formed in that plant if chlorsulfion was used at a half to one ounce, and I'd probably go at the one ounce rate. Um, and you have to use a surfactant with, with that as well. Scott's thistle is a different situation. It takes two to three ounces. The label says one to three ounces of chlorosulfuron 75. And the rosette, the very early bolt, and that's what I tried to show with that photograph on the bottom. Uh, again, the surfactant is of key importance, especially with the Scott's thistle. And sometimes we found instead of using a surfactant on Scott's thistle with chlorosulfuron, if we use mesylated seed oil, it worked even better. The yellow toad flax is probably my most favorite plant we ever worked on, mostly is because a lot of it was up in the flat tops area here in Colorado, which is a gorgeous wilderness, uh, but just laced with this all over the place. Now it is a handsome plant. It and Dalmatian toad flax were cultured as ornamentals for hundreds of years. And so they have some characteristics associated with that, not the least of which is convincing people to, to manage it. Uh, it has an interesting root bud phenology, just like Russian knapweed, and indeed we think that's the, why, why our uh, fall treatments work so well. And I'll, I'll, I'll flesh that out for you here as I go through. But it's native to the Eurasian area in Europe and Asia. It was introduced into North America in the 1600s, so it's been around a long time. It's naturalized across the country, but it's the biggest problem in the Intermountain West. Uh, very, very problematic for us in, in Colorado and Wyoming, and it just loves Colorado. I mean, who doesn't? But it's, uh, we're the headwaters, and it was introduced. We gave it an opportunity, and sure enough, it took every bit of it. I remember visiting with Hal Pierce, and he said he'd start spraying this stuff when the snow quit, quit flying in the spring <laughs> until it started flying again in the fall. So the, we, we, we think we discovered the optimum timing an application of a, of a herbicide to control it, but Hal would just grin at me because it's only for a very short period of time, as you will see. So my a student, Nick Crick, did this work, and as you can see, he took a very nice photograph showing uh, the, the root bud growth on, on a section of yellow toad flax roots. He had two sites along the front range here, and this, the, the, uh, on this graph, the thing to pay attention to is the solid black line. And each year at, each, at both locations, you can see there's an inflection point at flowering. The B is for bolting, F is for flowering, S is for senescence, and D is for dormant. These are periods, of course, of growth of the plants. And what he found is that each year at about flowering, there was this great inflection point between the lowest amount of, uh, of adventitious buds that he counted to the highest, and it continued clear into the winter months. Again, probably a good reason why the fall uh, fall applications work so well. And I'll, I'll, I'll flesh this out right now. Nick uh, did an experiment at five different locations, a very robust experiment where we examined race of chlorosulfion on a mazapir. And I'm just gonna ignore the mazapir because it just worked too well. I mean, it killed everything at sight. It's not a very selective herbicide. In fact, it's the basis for a number of our bare work ground programs. So we examined chlorosulfuron at zero, three quarters, one and a quarter, and one and three quarters ounces per acre. Uh, that becomes important here in a minute. The treatments were applied in September of 2008, and Nick collected data clear up through September 2010. And so this is this graph depicts the uh, yellow toad flax density two years after we treated with one of those chlorosulfuron treatments. And as you can see at Camp Hale and Hot Sulfur, that cluster of data, um, we had the greatest control, the green bar is what I'm looking at, and that's the one and three quarter ounce rate. And it was somewhere between 90 and 95% control. It wasn't 100, but we were really close and go, wow, what's going on there? And so we looked at Greenland, we didn't have the right situation. At the White River, we didn't have, and we actually had the correct situation with regard to plant biology at Wild Cat Canyon, but it was a droughty year. And when drought occurs, all bets are off with yellow toad flax. You probably just simply aren't going to get control. 
So what Nick found at Camp Hale was that 83% of the plants had gone through the reproductive cycle. 65% at application were in the post-flower growth stage. That's in essence the seed, the seed capsule growth stage. 18% of the shoots were still flowering. Flip over to the hot sulfur column of data. Um, it was in the late bloom and in essence about 76% of the plants had gone through a reproductive cycle. Saw the same thing at Wildcat Canyon, 75% of them had gone through or going through the reproductive cycle. So not quite as far along as Camp Hale or Hot Sulphur Springs, but adequate. But the drought, it's just simply nothing worked there. The other two sites, we didn't have that, uh, that threshold met. Now we did another experiment, basically at the same time, they weren't coordinated per se, but you can see the photographs that Jim took of the growth stages of the plants, they were in the seed capsule growth stage at application, and they had a lot of uh, adventitious root bud growth on the crown. 70% uh, of the plants that he looked at were, uh, were <clears throat> had root buds on them. We looked at dicamba as Banville and Overdrive, which is Diflofensipir plus dicamba, Triumph 22K or Picloram, but both 32 and 64 fluid ounces per acre. And then Triumph 22K plus Banville at 32 plus eight. And then the combination with Overdrive, and that's the one we were, we were hoping that would work. We looked at that uh, years before with uh, uh, yellow toe flax and nothing became of that one, but it clear, clearly is the case here that the Diffins appear in Overdrive enhance the activity of, of, uh, of the Picklin ram. We have no activity really to speak of out of the Banville alone or the Overdrive alone. And the Triumph 22K alone, even at two quarts per acre, didn't work as well as when we combined it at one quart per acre plus eight ounces of Overdrive. So that becomes our one of our treatments of choice. So to summarize this, um, regardless of which of those two herbicides you're gonna choose to use, 75% of the plants should be in the bloom or post-bloom growth stage at application. I'm trying to show that with this photograph down below. Or conversely, 25% of, of the shoots are still vegetative. The rate had to be high enough to overcome the spatial and temporal variation that we saw over the course of time. So chlorosulfion at one three quarters of an ounce per acre uh, works exceptionally well, but, but you have to mix in a pint and a half of MSO. Now that's a too high rate where it's grazed. The maximum rate of chlorosulfion is one and a third ounces uh, in a grazing situation. And you'll get decent control with that, but you're not gonna get as much as a one and three quarters, of course. Uh, so maybe in a graze situation, the Triumph 22K or Picloran plus overdrive would be a better choice at a quart of the Triumph 22K and eight ounces of, uh, of overdrive plus 1% or a pint, pint and a half of, uh, of per acre of, 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 excuse me, of MSO. Again, drought changes everything. We, we repeated this experiment at a location uh, near in Douglas County. Uh, well, it's getting close to retirement. And when we went to collect the, the last data set, it looked like things were working, but when I went back and, and put all the treatments uh, uh, together, nothing worked. It was just variation that occurred. And so it was very droughty at application. And I wondered about that and sure enough, that changes everything. Now Dalmatian toad flax is a little easier to control. Uh, we have two species, but the broadleaf Dalmatian toad flax is probably a bigger issue. It's a creeping, weakly creeping herbaceous perennial. Uh, similar to yellow toad flax, probably not nearly as strongly clonal as you can see from the photographs. Um, they may produce upwards of 400,000 seeds per plant in a moist year. Uh, so you got to be careful with it. But the photograph on the bottom right is after a fire, a year after fire. And of course, it responded very positively to that disturbance. Um, the linearial dalmatica is displayed in this map, but we have quite a bit of it in Colorado. I don't think this is difficult to control as is yellow toad flax, so it tends to be less of an issue, but it's formidable to be sure. Uh, we watched a patch, patch expansion at two sites. Uh, one of the sites had increased over 1200% in density over a period of six years and caused a decrease in, in crested wheatgrass cover at the same time. If that isn't enough to uh, stimulate you to do something about this, I don't know what would work. 
at the Boulder site, we only did it for three years and we got a doubling of the stem density, uh, but we also got an increase in grass cover at the same time. It's just different weather patterns. But again, uh, it, it's, it's increasing its uh, influence on the environment rapidly. Dalmatian toad flax can be controlled very well with one quart per acre of uh, picloram or triab 22K. Flowering has been one of the most, is most consistent uh, fall is also good, so it doesn't have, it's not so picky about uh, when it's most susceptible. Chlorosulfurol works as well, uh, 2 to 2.6 ounces per acre, so it can't be used in a gray situation, it'd be only a non-crop. And uh, MSO, one and a half pints per acre is, is what worked well, and again, it's most consistent in the fall rather than at flowering. Panoramic can be used, but notice the use rate, 12 fluid ounces. Now, we have a one of our bare ground programs, uh, we use Panoramic as, as, a, as a partner at 12 fluid ounces in the fall of the year, it's gonna create bare ground. It's really hard on grasses at that rate. So you're gonna have to, have, you have to have a reason to use it, just to be perfectly honest. But it's fall after a hard frost, 25% of the top can be necrotic, but still got green tissue present. It's hard to use compared to the other two herbicides. I think Triumph 22K is probably the best choice. And one of my favorite plants of all time is leafy spurge. Uh, Euphorbia astula, I know the creeping herbaceous perennial from hell, reproducing from seed and adventitious root buds, as you can see in the photograph in the bottom right, all those little pink buds. Now they're present all year round, so it's ready to rock and roll at a moment's notice. Uh, very aggressive and very difficult to control. Might be the most difficult plant to control that we have encountered, and maybe even in, the, in North America. Uh, we have a salesman in, in Allegheny that also has a spraying business, and he first encountered this, and he went, how do I kill this stuff? And he, he defines stuff a little differently. Uh, but I tell him, you don't. You just buy periods of time uh, when you don't have it. And he really didn't believe me. He believes me now because he's been working on it a couple of years. It has very broad ecological amplitude from very wet to very dry habitats, from the urban setting to rangeland, very widespread across the northern tier of states. Our understanding is it's not a problem in uh, the New England area, but uh, everywhere else it's a huge issue for us. Very, very difficult to control. I was first introduced to leafy spurge in a uh, in, in northwestern Colorado, this is the Nine Mile Ranch outside of Meeker, and there is Stephen now competing Gamble Oak. This is the Badlands in North Dakota, uh, adjacent to the Poudre River right here in Larimer County. I mean, it's 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 a very formidable plant, and it's very much at home right next door to you in in, the, in your neighborhood grocery store. Uh, it's very uh, <clears throat> to say it's it's a tough plant is an understatement. Uh, growing up through some freshly laid asphalt, growing out of a crack of a rock, and my personal favorite, growing out of a stump of a tree. You know, this is from Southwest Colorado. It's an amazing plant. Very difficult to control. The standard still is picloram. Our Triumph 22K is a good example of that. One quart per acre for two to three consecutive years applied in spring at flowering, true flowering as depicted in the upper right hand corner of a photograph. Um, and where you can mix it with 2,4-D at one to one and a, uh, one to one and a half pints of Triumph 22K and two quarts to 2,4-D, you will uh, expand the, the, the susceptible species of plants with that, of course, but it's gonna take another year. So that's always discouraging to people. And you'll usually get after the third year somewhere between 80 and 90% control. And when control dips back down to about 70%, you gotta start over again. So it's, it's a tough critter, uh, it is a tough critter. Uh, panoramic works pretty well too, eight to 12 fluid ounces in the fall. I'd avoid the 12 fluid ounces and stick closer to the eight, uh, where you at least have some selectivity for the grass competition that will finish the weed control job. MSO should be used at two pints per acre. It is safe around most trees and near water where you could not use uh, picloram. Paramount or Quinstar, which is Quinclorac, uh, has got a lot of mileage and some people see complete failure and others see it works pretty well. I did this at my daughter and son-in-law's place um, north of Fort Collins and it worked very well. It's a 16 ounces of product plus one and a half pints of MSO per acre. It's very expensive. Uh, but it does work well. It's spring, that's supposed to be at the green brack formation, not yellow, 
such as depicted in the photograph on the right. So it's a little earlier than, uh, than Triumph would be. Uh, it can also be applied in the fall and it is very safe around trees. This has been used a lot down uh, you know, on, on the Palmer Divide where the Spurge is, is encroaching. Hoary crest is a significant problem for us, has been for a long, long time. It's a, it's a creeping herbaceous mustard. We actually have three species of this. Uh, Lepidium draba or hoary crest is most prevalent, although you'll see there's some variation in that. It used, we used to think that the orbicular white top, which we used to call lens potted hoary crest, uh, may not even be in Colorado, but that's not the case. So hairy white top also is present. Now, the important thing is that the management is the same. Uh, the sulfonylurea is an imidazolones. Their claim to fame for as well as uh, is for uh, plant sensitivity is the mustard family. They're herbaceous, creeping herbaceous perennial, reproducing from seed and from roots. The hairy white top and orbicular white top are present throughout the Western US, but as you can see, hoary crest is the bigger problem and it's spreading to the east. This is kind of an egg-shaped leaf. Uh, so this is hoary crest or Lepidium draba. It can have a blunt or even a somewhat pointed leaf tip. You can see some serrations on that. Uh, you know it's the mustard, it smells bad. But when it gets to be this size, and so it grows about 12 to 18 inches tall, and there's two things, two ways you can tell it from perennial pepperweed, which is another mustard, is this one flowers very early. A hoary crest is one of the first uh, noxious weeds to flower in the spring of the year, often in March or April, uh, whereas perennial pepperweed is flowering in typically July. And the leaves of, of, of the, of the uh, Lepidium species that we call hoary crest uh, clasp the stem. And you can see some examples in this photograph thereof, and, then, and which distinguishes it from perennial pepperweed because they don't clasp the stem. It's called white top because, uh, of course, the flowers appear to be in a, in a single plane. This is actually a good growth stage uh, for using the sulfonylureas. It has monstrous root system problem, upwards of 30 feet deep, and the majority in the top two to four feet, um, but it can be a, a tremendous problem. The majority of the rhizomes within the first 24 inches, but this is why it recovers. It's just like the Canada thistle photograph I showed you. As far as control, again, the sulfonylureas and the, and the imidazolones are outstanding, but you'll notice there is a difference in optimum timing of application. Metsulfuron, our product is MSM60 and an ounce per acre works exceptionally well. But it's via the, what Steve Dewey used to call the broccoli growth dates, very early flower before any of the, any of the petals come out, or is this photograph on the right, you see the buds just starting to open up, that's a good timing. Uh, chlorosulfuron at an ounce is my pref preference because it'll provide soil residual that metsulfuron will not and control germinating seedlings after you control the adults. The optimum timing is bud to early flower. Remember the broccoli growth stage example. Panoramic is also a really good choice. It's eight to 12 fluid ounces per year, or excuse me, per acre, plus a couple of pints of MSO. The optimum timing is late flower to early post flower. So it's about two to three weeks later. We stumbled onto this when we were looking at um, some options for you know, controlling perennial pepperweed in the San Luis Valley. And it became really apparent that there is a huge difference uh, in, in optimum timing between the two classes of herbicides that are very similar uh, with regard to their, their uh, site of action. Perennial pepperweed is the last weed I'll talk about today. It's another uh, mustard species, Lepidium latifolium. It's another herbaceous creeping perennial reproducing from seed and from roots. It forms very dense monocultures, which I'll show you in just a little bit. Um, it's going to be found in different areas than, than, than hoary crest. They, they overlap quite a bit, but it's typically in riparian zones or soils with very high water tables. So think of the San Luis Valley where the, some parts of the year the water table is on the surface and the perennial pepperweed just loves that, hence why I have that photograph next to the creek. But you can see the substrate on the lower photograph where it's growing, um, the rocky soils and things of that nature. It grows well there. 
that's actually a photograph out of California. So they have a huge problem because the central part of California is a, uh, in their Delta areas is where they have the biggest problem with that. So, but along the South Platte River and, Co and Weld County uh, is a great example of another location. Widespread throughout the Western US and of course, the Western part of Colorado play is a bigger problem than the Eastern part, but it's distributed along the front range rather well. Uh, this is an experiment from ages ago. This is a one ounce rate of chlorosulfuron somewhere in Well County along the South Platte. But look how dense that monocult culture is. It just shades out everything. Some people even think it's allelopathic, but that's never really been demonstrated. The cows don't mind. They were really curious what we were doing out there. But you can see how big and robust this plant is. Uh, and yet at the same time, the, the, it's not very palatable, but grazing might be helping to keep it out of that pasture on the left, uh, or at a minimum, whoever owned that pasture is doing a better job of trying to manage it. But um, the dense nature of that stand on the right side of that fence line is pretty dramatic. Again, one way to tell this from hoary crest is that it does not clasp the stem like hoary crest does, that is that being the leaves, but it has a long petiole and this will become apparent even as, as the plant bolts, uh, even towards the top of the plant. The flowers are very similar, although they do not appear to occur in a single plane, but they're white petals in the shape of a cross and hence the old name cruciferi. As far as control, uh, once again, the sulfonylureas ureas or the imidazolones work exceptionally well. Uh, MSM 60 at one ounce per acre at the bud to flower and growth stage. Don't forget the surfactant at a quarter of a percent. Uh, Chlorosulfur on 75 with the soil activity, you can get some germinating seedlings afterwards. However, it's at a time of year, you're not getting a lot of seedling recruitment because it's gonna be a, oh, a, you know, a June to July, first part of July application. But it's one ounce per acre at the bud to flower growth stage. And again, with surfactant. Uh, panoramic is also a good choice, 8 to 12 fluid ounces. I probably stick down towards the 8 fluid ounce range. Uh, flowering into senescence, again, a couple weeks, two to three weeks later than you would uh, use, than, you, than when you would use the sulfonylureas. And instead of a non ionic surfactant, use an MSO with a panoramic, because with all the imidazolam. So that's all I have. If you have any questions, I would be happy to try to answer them. All right, Jonathan, we have uh, some questions here. We have time for two, so we'll take the two that are in the chat. This okay. one from Christy. Our horse riding arena becomes consumed with Russian thistle. Is there a weed aside for Russian thistle that is safe to use around horses? Um, there would be a, a potential uh, good use for um, product called Rejuvra in uh, early in the year you'd want to use a uh, combination with something like uh, over not overdrive but overdrive would also work um, open site or it's also sold as chaparral available at Murdoch's uh, Rejuvra is very pricey and unfortunately it's only available in um, two and a half gallons, so um, might be something that you'd want to have a contractor spray it or um, use the uh, chaparral and, and just uh, go after the um, Russian thistle um, with mechanically after that. Thank you. And a question from Karen. Can you address mullen control? Mullen control is, is a, a challenge. You definitely want to have uh, a methylated seed oil in the mix with your, your herbicide because it, the hairiness of the leaves precludes uh, the herbicide reaching the leaf surface. And, uh, and again, chaparral works very well. Also, uh, uh, milestone which uh, Dr. Beck was referring to the generic version, which is whetstone, um, works well 
in combination with uh, Telar is even a, a better result. Excuse me. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, one more question real quick. What is the effect of the herbicides on predatory bugs? At this point, we find very little uh, information in regards to damage to the bugs. The herbicides are specific to the weeds. The challenge is um, if you get a complete kill of, of the weeds, then you might be destroying your, your biocontrols uh, food source. Um, but they did accidentally find in North Dakota fighting leafy spurge that they could actually increase their their uh, spurge control by re releasing the bugs in the spring and then uh, doing a, a late fall treatment on the spurge. So there are some advantages, but uh, you know, I try to focus on the fact that biological control should be where you can't get to with a herbicide so that your herbicide treatments will actually force the biocontrols to those areas. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Everyone, we're going to take a quick five minute break and we'll resume at 10.35.
Again, this is Jonathan Reif, Douglas County Weed and Mosquito Control Program Coordinator. I've been in this position since 1991, and I um, currently am the Secretary Treasurer of the Colorado County Weed Supervisors Association. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about gardening versus weeds, specifically noxious weeds. Again, I graduated from Kansas State University in 1980, so I've been uh, working on gardening in Colorado since 1991, and it's it's a challenge at, at uh, Colorado uh, in as a whole, but especially here in Douglas County when the average uh, frost-free date is May 23rd. So what soils are you uh, planting into? Well, you have to plan for what is there. And uh, when they built my subdivision in Castlewood Ranch, um, the backfill was, was a heavy clay and it's uh, not very conducive to gardening. So um, we, uh, and there are many different ways to research what is on your site, but what was on your site may not be uh, what's there now because, you know, for example, there's a lot of construction in Douglas County, as most of you are aware, and then Castlewood Ranch and Founders and places uh, that they've been recently developing, um, they've dug down six foot or more in some places. So uh, what, what are they replacing the soil is a big option and question as far as what is going to be growable in your site. And according to the 2010 uh, U.S. Census, 81% of the nation's population lives in urban areas, and in most of those areas, the current soil information is in incomplete, outdated, or non-existent, and the soils in these areas have been so mo modified that any previous maps no longer provide correct information. And uh, there, USDA has even come out with a uh, urban soil primer to figure out what to do on your site and how to improve it. And here's a couple of websites that you could use to um, research that more completely. So how big is your lot? That depth of the topsoil replaced, again, will dictate how much soil amendments need to be added. Was at least six inches replaced? Kind of hard to get your turf grass to grow if you don't have something like that there. Um, remember, topsoil is sometimes less desirable here than um, the subsoils of Kansas or Texas or other parts of the U.S. Again, the frost-free date is uh, average of, of uh, May 23rd. The cast rocks at 6,205 feet officially, um, and 22-year rain average is 14.56 inches. Uh, rainfall equivalent on the Highlands Ranch Western End at uh, Castler Water tr Treatment Plant is 17.41 inches of rain equivalent a year. And Parker is uh, a little bit lower, obviously, than Castle Rock at 13.41 inches of rain equivalent. So it's not as good a place to garden in, as Castle Rock slightly. Um, Monument there at the uh, south end of the county, you're at about 7,400 feet and 18.55 inches of rain equivalent. So um, you can add topsoil or you can add uh, special garden soil from Lowe's or Home Depot or, or wherever you want to uh, go for that. Um, mostly it's a combination of peat and, and uh, manure and other products. You can also buy it in bulk at my old house here in Castle Rock. We had two uh, tandem loads of enriched topsoil brought in for the front yard, and uh, it uh, grew turf much better. Many gardeners are using raised beds, and this is uh, mine that I inherited with the house. I'm in the process of rebuilding it using uh, redwood 2x6s um, and 2x8s. Um, redwood being a natural product has less tendency to possibly have any heavy metals leaching into the soil. 
and uh, black plastic is often used as a mulch in between your your uh, plants that you uh, plant into the area. Obviously, uh, those that you plant as seeds uh, will need to have the whole row uncovered. And I believe that drip irrigation is the way to go. It minimizes what uh, water evaporation you might encounter and uh, the plastic mulch will extend the growing season and heat the soil up quicker so you'll have a better result for your vegetables. It gives a new constructor an option of adding whatever soils work for them. So raised beds are definitely an option that helps in that regard too. But the invasive weeds or noxious weeds are what plants that don't stay where we planted them, which uh, was alluded to earlier in regards to um, escaped ornamentals being a, a major problem in the uh, U.S. and non, especially Colorado as well. Non-native aggressive plants that uh, spread by roots and seeds. I was once asked to uh, go back to that. I was on, once asked about um, yellow toad flax, and somebody had planted it uh, years ago. Uh, buying it as butter and eggs and they wondered what to do with it because it had taken over their rock garden and I said uh, get the roundup out and you're going to probably have to spray it more than once but that's the best thing is spray it with the roundup and then start over with a different plant. Some of the noxious weeds are poisonous to humans and livestock so that's something else to be aware of for the, from the noxious weed standpoint. But gardening uh, you know, as far as Colorado noxious weeds, uh, we're looking at non-native plants only, so most of the time you won't have them in a garden, but I have encountered them. I have encountered them, you know, seed blown in, obviously from the thistles. Um, Canada thistle has been one that I've found in my garden. Um, and so sometimes you'll have to use a herbicide, especially once they've become established. Field bindweed will take over. Uh, even though it's a C-list weed, you need to uh, use a herbicide in most cases. And uh, again, lo list A noxious weeds in Colorado, there are 25 species, rare or not found in the state yet. And by law, those are to be eliminated. So they can only be uh, controlled by digging, pulling, or herbicides, and uh, depending on what the biology of the plant is. And the list B species, there are 38 species. Uh, some of them are rare and some of them are regionally common. And by law, they are to be eliminated or controlled depending on their rarity. Uh, for example, uh, the plant leafy spurge is common in Douglas County, but in Chafee County, they could probably cover uh, one, the one patch they have with a pickup truck. So... Um, and again, C-list weeds are to control at your own discretion. I've also seen um, mullein in my uh, garden. Uh, depends on where you got your topsoil too for some times. So in Douglas County, these are common B-list weeds that you'll probably find encroaching into your yard. And uh, the first four, Dalmatian toad flax, yellow toad flax, Canada thistle and leafy spurge, are perennial plants, meaning they will come back from the roots and they will spread by roots. They're, they're uh, creeping perennials. And again, field bindweed is a creeping perennial. And uh, Kansas did a study years ago that said that the seeds would last 50 to 100 years. Um, and common mullein says 80 to 100 years. Uh, I take back the 100 years on the bindweed. I don't remember anybody ever saying 100 years on bindweed, but still, it is a, a monumental um, situation. So we have 12 B-list weeds in Douglas County that are common. How can you help yourself and your neighborhood and county? Plant only non-invasive species when you acquire plants. Remove invasive species from your land or your garden learn the noxious weeds for the area, remove seeds stuck to your clothes or gear, wash mud and dirt off your vehicle before entering public lands. Here's an idea. Wash them off before you enter your garden and after you enter your garden so you'll reduce any 
um, tracking of, of weeds in and out of your garden. Stay on established roads and hike or designated trails when you are hiking. Uh, and I know we have a lot of people hike in Douglas County and we have lots of dog parks. Um, be aware that you may accidentally pick up some weeds or somebody may have accidentally dropped some weeds in those areas. So be aware of that and clean your shoes when you leave the area. Do not trade plants with other gardeners. And don't pick up an un, the unknown plant thinking that it looks like it's very beautiful. I had a person call when I was uh, president of the Colorado Weed Management Association several years ago. She was complaining about myrtle spurge causing her to have dermatitis and uh, come to find out she had taken it out of the um, motel landscaping that she, where she stayed in Durango, intending to plant it in New Mexico where she lived. And so she was self-inflicting herself in that regard. And uh, um, unfortunately, we have are our own worst enemies sometimes. But you can help educate your community and your um, personal contacts and garden clubs, etc. And I am available to uh, come and specifically talk to those areas uh, at your club or, or garden um, group. My first f sighting of absinthe wormwood was call, um, confirmed by my colleagues via the internet with uh, digital photos. So you can take digital photos and email them to me and my email will be uh, posted uh, at the end of the, the uh, discussion here. Uh, tansy ragwort that I thought was um, on some of our property turned to be out to be a native form. And few people know every weed or plant in the U.S. And, uh, you know, the, the people that know those are botanists usually. And they would ask uh, Colorado State University or another university or myself how to kill them because their forte is identifying those plants. I use the annual research from uh, CSU in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Wyoming, Utah, and Montana for my go-to. Uh, labels change, so at least before you go buy a new batch of herbicide, verify that it was the one you want. And these are some of the re reference books that I use to um, identify weeds and identify how to kill them. And unfortunately, uh, un almost anything can be purchased on the internet. And this was a recent research uh, that I did by, with Google and uh, came up with an Amazon search. And uh, there are several noxious weeds that are still being sold via the internet. Sometimes they'll honor the fact that Colorado considers some of these plants noxious and not sell them to you because you live in Colorado, but there is no guarantee of that either. So competitive vegetation is a must in regards to noxious weeds, whether it be in your garden or your, your lawn. And so you need to be out there, um, you know, controlling it with black plastic or one of my least favorite things is pulling the weeds. But uh, in your garden, you've got to keep those um, unwanted plants out of your area. And, you know, really in a garden, in the area that you want uh, corn, uh, a bean is a weed. So um, <clears throat> non-noxious weeds are just taking it a step further. And again, yellow toad flax wants to dominate the countryside. Uh, Dr. Beck said something about leafy spurge being the toughest weed to control, but I'm not sure that that's true anymore. Uh, got biocontrols working very well in the county, and uh, yellow toad flax is still... Um, in my opinion, the hardest one to control, the most expensive one to control. So there are use precautions for each of these because there are some residuals that la last in the soil for a time and you could have issues with that. So uh, depending on the herbicide that you're going to use on your uh, turf or on your garden, you gotta read the label to know 
what to look for as far as um, damage to the plants or, um, again, don't use clippings off of some of these in your garden itself or you could end up killing your vegetables. And uh, some of them are labeled for specific grasses and, and some are not. And a hand can is very good for small areas like uh, the neighbor's A-list myrtle spurge. And uh, backpack is for larger areas. Uh, contractors often use ATVs or golf carts and uh, not all Roundup bottles are the same. Um, Roundup Super Concentrate uh, versus Roundup 365 versus Roundup Extended. Um, some of them can be used in the garden on your um, bindweed problems, but some of them cannot because they will kill your vegetables as well. And sometimes it is needed, depending on what you're fighting. Uh, bindweed, you would have to pull it every week um, throughout the growing season. In conclusion, early detection, rapid response, uh, cooperation between your neighbors, um, and good management practices. And, and you know, in the case of grazing, which isn't necessarily something you worry about when you're gardening, but that can issue uh, additional problems. And uh, you probably will need to amend the soil for your garden and consult with uh, us or a CSU extension, and they will give you uh, answers to your questions. And uh, here's my email address, or you can call and set up a time for a free site visit and a free um, weed plan. And if you want to spray your own weeds, uh, we also have a free calibration so that you know how to get that one ounce per acre over that 43,000 square feet. That's a, a challenge that most people don't even think about. Thank you, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Jonathan. We have some time for questions. If you want to put your questions in the chat, I will read them aloud. Our first question, Jonathan, is from Laura. Are there are any of the herbicides usable on, quote, organic fields, i.e. for cattle, goats, etc.? There are herbicides, uh, primarily uh, things like um, high concentration vinegar um, that are organically labeled. R Roundup is not. Uh, 240 is not. Those are probably two of the most commonly used uh, in turf and, and ornamental uh, and gardening situations. Um, but uh, you're much more restricted on what is available with organic. And I would check with, if you want to have all the uh, information on organic, I would check with the um, Colorado Department of Agriculture's website. They have all the uh, different organic pesticides listed there. Thank you, Jonathan. Another question from Carrie. Do I really need to cut down my two large established Russian olive trees in the downtown Castle Rock area? You know, that's a good question. And uh, I have uh, had discussions with the Colorado Department of Agriculture in regards to that. Yes, they are listed on the B list for noxious weeds. Uh, we have a couple on our uh, property uh, at um, industrial way that we've been watching very closely for the last several years. Um, and some subdivisions, for example, Sierra Vista subdivision in the Parker area, <clears throat> large areas were planted with uh, Russian olive for windbreaks. And uh, in visiting with the Department of Ag, I said, uh, I don't think anybody has a political clout to take that on. Unless you could go out and say, okay, I've got a coupon for a free eight foot tree from Lowe's or Home Depot or Pine Lane Nursery, then you're not gonna be able to do that or you will be looking for a job. And um, so, yes, don't watch it. If it spreads, cut off the any suckers that might occur, but 
uh, we've not been observing any suckers in, in our area that we're looking at out at the industrial way. I would say don't worry about it, but don't plant any new ones. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, there are no more questions at this time, so can move on to the next item in the agenda. Okay. Well, our next uh, speaker is Kate Caswell, uh, who uh, today's the first day I've been able to meet her. Uh, she's um, the new small acreage management and uh, uh, professional for uh, CSU, and she also works a little bit with an uh, NRCS, and I'll let her explain how that um, combination works, but uh, she has a minor in animal science and, and um, uh, she has a master's degree in agronomy, um, which is where my uh, bachelor's degree is, and, and um, we will hear from her. Hi, good morning. Um, this is my first in-person presentation in about a year, so that's kind of exciting for me. Um, anyway, my name is Kat Castle. I am the CSU Small Acreage Specialist for the Front Range Region, and I realized in practicing this, practicing this presentation last night, I forgot to put I am a joint position with the NRCS, so I can help with both NRCS programs and just general education from CSU, um, all surrounding small acreage. I also forgot to put my email address on this presentation. So it's just my name, cat.caswell at colostate.edu. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about uh, managing grazing in your small scale pastures or on your small acreages. And this whole day has been really fun for me because I did do my master's in weed science. So I'm always excited to hear more about weeds and weed management. Um, so grazing can be a really, really great tool when it comes to weed management. Um, it can both harm you and it can help you. So we have this picture on the left, which was at a cornfield that was planted to cover crops. We didn't quite get the grazing timing a little right and um, we had plenty of horseweed come up and be a bit of a problem for this guy. But we can also have some really, really great management like these uh, cattle on the left, sorry, the right. This is actually a rangeland picture from Eastern Colorado. And these guys had fantastic rotational grazing. Um, they knew when to target their grazing to control weeds and they could stockpile their grasses and had some really great forage um, all the way into the early winter. So we can't talk about grazing management or much in Colorado without talking about drought conditions. Uh, so I pulled this down from the US Drought Monitor just on Wednesday. Um, so we're still sitting in some pretty extreme drought across the state. Some of it's been mitigated in the Northern Front Range, but across the state, we're largely still looking at a deficit. So this is a hydrological drought. It's not necessarily what we call an agricultural drought. So we'll still see effects on plants this coming spring. And we do have the possibility of moving further into drier conditions throughout the spring, depending on what moisture we get coming up. So we, we could get more, we could get less. Um, so a lot of times when I'm talking about grasses with landowners, just keep in the back of your mind that we could hit another drought and what is your contingency plan if we do hit that drought. So why even bother managing grazing? Well, one, it improves the health of your grass. It improves the productivity of your grass. And because that grass is healthy and growing, it can really resist weeds. And that kind of goes back to your integrated pest management strategies. If you have competitive grasses that are doing really well, you can outcompete those weeds moving in. And it's a lot easier to spot when you do have infestations moving in and you can spot treat them and control them a lot sooner. Also, it's just good land management and good land stewardship. It uh, can improve water quality, reduce erosion. Um, it looks nicer, if you ask me, to be looking at a grass field than just some dirt blowing around. So overall, it's, it's going to help you. So these are some of the questions that I always ask um, landowners or producers whenever I meet with them first when they want to talk about grazing. For one, do you have animals? Do you plan on grazing those animals? How many do you have and what type? 
So how we're going to graze a sheep is gonna be a bit different than how we're gonna graze a cow versus how we graze a horse. Um, or, and if you're planning animals, how many animals do you intend to get? Are you trying to do enough that you have enough meat to put in the freezer or are they just for fun so the kids have a pet sheep? or whatever you want. Um, in Colorado, we always need to think about our water source. Do you have irrigation? Do you have water rights? Do you have a holding pond? Um, do you have ditch shares? Or are you relying on rainfall? Are you gonna be dry land? Are you going to just hope that we get enough moisture that you get some extra grazing that year? Think about what your current pasture conditions are. Do you want to improve them? Do you want to maintain them? And that's gonna dictate kind of your starting point. And then what resources do you have? We like to think of these really big, awesome, cool plans, but maybe they take a bit more time than what we really have. Some guys are retired, so you can go out and spend all day working on your property. Sometimes you're weekend warriors, and you need to come up with a strategy that you can get done on a couple of weekends every month. Also, do you have a budget? And with that budget, do you have access to equipment, or do you have to rent or buy equipment? And then we always want to talk about expectations. So we have a lot of people moving into Colorado from other areas of the country. I mean, myself included. I'm a proud Penn State Nittany Lion. So what I first thought of as what a pasture should look like in Pennsylvania looks a lot different than what a healthy pasture looks like in Colorado. So kind of think of what your long-term goal is and what you really want that pasture to look like at the end of the day. So... My, my training is in agronomy, so I always kind of think, all right, what's, what's the crop we're managing in this field this year? Well, for your pasture, it's your grasses. It's those pasture plants. And sometimes there might be legumes and forms mixed in there, but we're really going to be talking about grasses. So just some really quick physiology of grasses. Um, we have the stem, and that's made up of your nodes and your internodes, the leaf blades, and that's that what we typically think of as the leaf, and that's going to be the part that's doing most of the photosynthesis. That was a struggle today. Um, and then finally, we have that seed head. So that will be like the flower of the grass. And when we're trying to tell grasses apart from one another, a lot of time the species differences come down to small details on that collar region, so where the leaf actually meets the stem, or on the seed head of the plant. So sometimes those little collar regions are very, very small and difficult to tell apart. So if you're really struggling to identify a grass, it is typically easier to wait until that grass has a seed head on it and we can distinguish between multiple species. So if we're gonna be talking about growing our grass well, we can talk about how grass grows. Uh, we wanna talk about the growing points. So this point is the location where there's actually new tissue growing on the plants. So we call that the meristematic tissue. And that's where the cells are actively dividing. So the initial growing points will be at the soil surface or just below the soil surface. So if we get a, a late frost, as long as those growing points are still protected by the soil, a lot of times that grass will survive and continue to grow. And then slowly over time, this uh, growing point will move further up. So think about a pointer that you would extend, right? This is how the growing point moves up. So the youngest leaves are at the top, the oldest leaves are at the bottom. And a corn plant was just a big, big grass plant. So think about how those bottom leaves on the corn plant die down first. They're typically the oldest and they lose, they lose light first. We also wanna think about the different species in our field. Um, when we're managing a pasture, we wanna manage it as a whole pasture, not necessarily section by section. So we wanna find two species that predominantly make up the entirety of our pasture and that complement each other. And different species can be grazed at different heights. So some species like crested wheatgrass, Kentucky bluegrass can be grazed at four to six inches and then be grazed down to around two or three inches. So kind of going with the principle of take half, leave half. But we do have a lot of our species that are really common, like uh, different bromes and orchard grasses that have to wait until they're about six or eight inches and then you don't want to graze them below four inches. So this is, this is why it's important to know what is actually uh, making up your pasture and how to best manage that. So it's really always important to remember when we're talking about our pasture plants that we need to leave enough leaf surface there that we can continue photosynthesis and those leaves can continue to make carbs and energy and food for the plant. If we graze all those leaf blades off and leave just a stem, it's unlikely that plant will be able to recover as well as it would have otherwise. The same thing goes with the growing points. If we graze too low, too often, and continually damage that growing point, it's less likely those plants will come back and they might slowly disappear out of the pasture. 
And then really quick, because there's always livestock involved in this, um, we want to think about the nutrient content and when the ideal time for grazing is. When the plant is kind of early in its growth stage, early in the spring, so what a lot of our grasses look like right now, it's mostly vegetative, it's like that A picture uh, that's really high nutritional quality. In the B picture, that grass is almost about to send out a seed head. We call this the boot stage. There's slightly more stem in that stem to leaf ratio, so it's a little bit lower in nutritional quality, but it's really good grazing time. And then there's picture C, and this is when the plant has completely had a seed head emerge. Um, oftentimes, for some of our grass species, we want to wait until this point, either A or uh, sorry, either B or C. Uh, for hay because we can get the optimum amount of tonnage from it. And there's some species that do best when we graze them at the sea level. Uh, but in general, at this point, with the amount of stem that's on the plants, it's more fibrous and thus making it less palatable and slightly less nutritional content for the animals. So I typically try to graze around that B, somewhere in between B and C level. It's also important to think about plant roots. Um, this is where plants are pulling nutrients from. They get their nutrients like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus from the soil. So we need to make sure that we're not grazing our plants so heavily that we deplete this root system. And it's important to remember that the plant has to regenerate 30% of its root system each year in addition to expanding its roots so it can grow even larger. So just keep that in mind that we want to make sure we're keeping our root systems healthy as well. And a lot of the times these big root systems can then uh, get deeper into the soil and access additional moisture. So when we're grazing, we again want to keep thinking about that root system. Now, if we look at that smallest plant all the way on the end, that is a continuously grazed plant that uh, has not had any rest allowed for it. And if you think about it going from the largest plant to the smallest plant there, that would be if we continuously grazed it, we're constantly knocking that plant back, we're not allowing it to regrow, we're not giving it a chance to recover that root system, we're gonna slowly over time just decrease that plant's ability to survive and it might move out of the pasture completely. That largest plant would have been under a management strategy that was more of a rotational grazing or mob grazing, where we graze it quickly, we get it down just the height we want, and then we give it the full time amount of recovery that it needs in order to regrow to a healthy grazing level. Again, um, there we wanna think about how the plants grow. So we have cool season and warm season grasses. Cool season grasses prefer cooler temperatures. So this is like Kentucky bluegrass or orchard grass. They come up earlier in the spring they typically peak somewhere um, early summer, May, June, and they hit the summer slump. So they're still green and growing, but they won't be growing as quickly. They'll just kind of slow down. Some might go semi-dormant, um, and then they might have another little flush again in the fall, and you might be able to get some second grazing off of them, maybe, if we have enough moisture. We live in Colorado, it's all moisture dependent. Warm season grasses are just the inverse of cool season grasses, so they emerge Later in the summer, they peak June, July, August, and then they drop off pretty quickly and turn brown. So think something like a green sorghum or corn is just a, our kind of most obvious examples of a warm season grass. So you bought a property and you're really excited and you wanna get some animals out there and you're kind of thinking, how many animals can I actually fit on this property? Well, one, you're gonna to need to check your zoning regulations first and foremost, um, but your zoning will dictate the maximum amount of animals you can have, but that doesn't mean that's the amount of animals you can sustainably keep on that property. Uh, so a lot of times the amount of forage that's there, if we plan on getting all of our animals feed from our pastures, that amount of forage is gonna vary by season to season, if we're in a drought, if we're in a wet year, if we've had a really cold spring, maybe things won't grow as quickly in the spring, um, if we have water, avail water availability, and then just the forage type that's even out there, along with what the animal needs. So a young growing animal might need more feed than an older animal. Um, are they skinny and you're trying to bulk them up? Are they uh, heavily used animals if you're using them for uh, leisure or exercise? And then if the animal's pregnant or not. So there's just a lot of variations that are gonna go into how much you can actually get off that ground. So a really good example of this is just thinking if you need to feed your animal 30 pounds of forage a day. So that means you'll need around 11,000 pounds a year and you have just one pasture that's one acre. And you know that pasture produces around 900 pounds of forage per year. And that's pretty common for a dryland pasture in Colorado. It will typically produce just under a ton. And then we're going to assume that there's only 30% utilization of the grass that's actually there. 
Um, this might seem really low, but this is kind of our baseline. We can either move that utilization percentage up or down based on management strategies, but a lot of our forage is lost just to things like animals walking on it, if there's leaf area left over from old grazing, uh, manure standing out there, we lose a good bit to wildlife. Um, in Loveland, there's an elk herd that grazes up and down. Uh, one of the valleys, they'll take off grass as well. So, okay, we've got our 900 pounds. We assume 30% utilization. That means there's only 270 pounds of usable forage from that one acre a year. If we need to feed, feed our animal 30 pounds a day, that means we only have nine days of grazing from that one pasture a year. So if we're going to meet the full needs of that animal, we'll need 41 acres to feed that animal solely on grazed forage a year. And 41 acres, if you live on the front range, it's kind of a big property, um, just, just for one animal. So a lot of times, if you're planning on keeping, especially horses, unless you have irrigation uh, and you can encourage regrowth faster by irrigating, you're going to assume that you're going to need to either buy all or the vast majority of your feed and then use pastures more as light grazing and turnout areas. So you don't wanna graze those pastures until they're at least six to eight inches tall, um, and then not graze them for more than seven to 10 days in an area. And that length is really going to depend on the forage and the quality and the amount you have that year. So a good kind of strategy is to feed your animals before you turn them out. So feed them in a dry lot, in the barn, whatever resource you have. So that way they're kind of full and satiated and less likely to go out there and dive towards that candy bowl in the pasture. Um, and then consider if you're planting uh, a new species or a new pasture area, using something with a little bit lower palatability but has high traffic resistance. So it can handle animals walking on it frequently or maybe riding on it frequently, but it's less likely that the animals are really gonna wanna eat that. So we always wanna think like, I'm, I'm one of those people who as soon as it hits spring, I wanna get outside. I wanna see animals out on the pasture, beautiful frolicking chickens, what have you. But you can't really ask, are my animals ready to get out of the barn? Am I ready to get them out of the barn? You really have to go based on your grass. You need to ask, is my grass actually ready? Has it hit that six to eight inches tall? So a lot of our strategies really need to be based off of our grass conditions. So we see a good amount of overgrazing occur from either leaving stock on the pasture for too long, so we leave those four cows out on the pasture for three months straight, or we bring them back too soon. So we take them off the pasture, we let it regrow, but we don't let it regrow long enough, and we put animals back on, and we ding up that pasture pretty badly. So we want to think about these two pictures are a great example of uh, stocking density versus stocking rate. So both of these pastures have the same stocking rate. They both have 100 animal days per acre, right? But that first picture has a very low stocking density. There's just that one animal on 100 days for grazing. It's more likely that animal is going to kind of cherry pick what it likes out of the field. It'll go through and it'll munch on just whatever it thinks is best. And then rather than eating the things it doesn't like, it's gonna go back to the new growth and hammer that those new growing plants that it liked before, it's gonna eat them again. This is a lot of times when we start seeing overgrazing from understocking. That second picture with all those tiny cows in there is 100 animals for one day. So this would be more of a mob grazing or high stocking density. So that will have much more uniform grazing across the entire field. Um, those animals will be forced to consume what's around them. They can't really pick so much. And then we get them off the next day and allow that pasture to completely regrow. So those two effect will have different effects. They could uh, both hurt you and harm you depending on your management. It's important to actually know what height your grass is at. Take a ruler, you can't do it from the dashboard, you can't do it from the window of the house. You need to go out and walk your pastures and have an idea of where that grass actually is and how well your management's working. So remember to always look behind. Did your, uh, what rest period did my pastures need and what did I actually give them? And then look ahead, say, all right, I want to turn them out in two weeks, but has this pasture actually had enough time yet? So I'm going to have to come back and check again. And then look at where your livestock is right now. Are you at a good stocking rate? You can make adjustments throughout the year. If the cattle are moving through that pasture three days faster than you thought they would, you can adjust the time you move them or you can give them extra space. It's completely flexible and you need to find the system that really works best for you. 
So from this image, if you're going to think about what your monitorings tell you, this would look like a, a pretty obvious moment of understocking and overgrazing to me. There's lots of really short grasses and then clumps of really tall grasses. So you might see those overgrazed grasses that the horses obviously really like slowly move out of our pasture over time and give a chance for weeds to move in. Like we're looking at in this picture, there's some really just open spaces um, the conservationist in me is just seeing soil erosion possibilities, but also the weed scientist is saying, oh, there's a lot of empty space for some weeds to move in here. You might start getting some thistles. So having grass, there's gives, having grass there will give less of an opportunity for those weeds to move in. Or maybe you're looking back and saying, hey, I've got some nice grass on this side of the fence. That rotational greasing is working pretty well for me. And maybe on the other side, it, it hasn't been working so well. Maybe you left the animals out a little bit too long during drought. So look back, take a, take a stock of what you're doing and then make adjustments to meet your, your future needs. So there's some really great key strategies we wanna think about when managing our pastures. One, you can always subdivide pastures. You can do it with temporary electric fencing. You can do it with permanent fencing. There's a lot of options for this. You can also create sacrifice area, and I think these are fantastic. It's a great place to put your animals when we have really heavy rains, and you don't want them out there chewing up the dirt and causing uh, rips and damage to your pasture. It's also really great when we have extreme drought, and we need to take animals off the pasture to protect it uh, just from damage during drought. So having an area that your animals can be safe and dry, and you can easily feed them, and access to water, of course. So when we're subdividing pastures, always consider the layout, how you're going to get the animals there. Do you have to haul water or do they have water access out there? What type of fencing you're going to choose? How much upfront cost is this going to be? How quickly can you do this? How quickly can you move the animals? Do you need to make a system that you can get out there and move them before you go to work? Or is it okay if you kind of have a more slow approach to it? And then how can you utilize your existing facilities? Use what you've already got to your best advantage. And then how good that forage is actually looking out there. I'm a big fan of temporary electric fencing. Um, I love these plastic white step-in posts. They're pretty easy to get in the ground when the ground is soft. Um, when it's harder, you kind of have to find a crack and stomp them in a little bit. But they're, they're very easy to set up and a pretty low learning curve to get used to them. Um, and then there's different types of poly tape and poly wires. If you have horses, the poly tape is probably your better bet. Uh, poly wires work very well with cattle and pigs. If you intend to do goat, sheep, or chickens, I would really recommend using the poly wire netting. It's a, a bit of a pain to get used to setting it up and how to take it down without it turning into a jumbled mess. But once you kind of get the hang of it, it's fantastic, works like a charm. Um, solar chargers are not wildly expensive. You can get chargers that can plug into existing power sources or just movable solar chargers. Won't run you more than a couple hundred bucks. So this is a re really great example of rapid rotational grazing. And around that edge of the green area, you can see that there is some permanent fencing. And then within that permanent fencing, it's been broken down into six smaller pastures using just temporary electric fencing. So animals will be able to access those individual paddocks uh, based on what gate you open on the day. So they have that center alleyway that they can move down and then you can let them into the fresh pasture move them out at night, or just open up the next gate the next morning and move them over into the next pasture. That holding area is really great because you have access to water up at the top of that, which means you won't have to haul water out to your pastures. And it also means it's less likely that animals are gonna congregate in one corner and apply excessive amount of newer um, and cause some uh, damage to the grass in one corner. So it makes, it makes the management of your pastures a little bit easier. And then here's just an example of a radial pasture configuration. So I have a cursor, I think. Um, in the center is an existing barn that has a confinement area around it. And then the pasture access is just based on what gate you open that day. And this is another great thing because you can run a lot of your electric fencing right from the barn if you've got power hookups. And again, you've maybe you've got your uh, extra feed up there and the water access is up there rather than having to run hoses down. So these pastures are actually pretty big. Um, you can further subdivide these if you want, depending on what your forage is like that year. So here's a really great example that was uh, created by my predecessor in this position, actually, who was working with an individual who had moved into the area and bought 
think it was around five acres, and was really surprised that she wasn't going to get her full forage grazing for her horses off of her five acres in Colorado. So what she did instead was create herself a little paddock paradise, and it works really well, and she was probably really happy with this after the drought. But up at the top of this hill, you can see we have an existing barn. And then they, she's got an alleyway that runs down the middle, right? So a lot of her water sources, her feeders are all up in this main barn area. And then each day, she can move the horses from one paddock to the next just simply by opening a gate and moving them over to the next paddock over or taking them up, from this, up to the barn. She's also got uh, an extra gate kind of halfway down the alleyway, so if she needs to completely confine the horses and keep them off the pastures totally, she can, she can do that with relative ease. Um, I've seen sort of similar setups for um, doing rotational grazing on cornfields with cattle, grazing cover crops, and similar situations with dairy cattle that have been are moving in and out of the barn because they have to be milked every day. So once you kind of train the animals to this, a lot of times, especially cattle, they can move themselves. If you just open one gate, uh, open the gate they're in, open the gate they're going to, a lot of times they'll just move right to that nice fresh forage. So it's always really important to keep records, keep records, keep records. Take pictures of your successes, take pictures of your failures. Um, I know we don't want to take pictures of our failures. It's kind of sometimes a bad memory, but uh, take pictures of your failures because then you can know how to change and know how to do better. So write down the grazing order of your pastures when you started grazing, when you stopped grazing, how many animals you put in that pasture for how long they were in that pasture, and then take notes on the general health and productivity. So was it doing super well in the spring and now you've hit that summer slump? Write that down. Um, and then keep track of your seasonal variations in weather. So take notes of what that spring conditions were like or that late fall conditions were like. I, when managing with land, I preferred to use just, I got some really inexpensive little notebooks that could fit in my back pocket. And it was really easy just to whip it out and say, I've got a Canada infestation, Canada thistle infestation starting in pasture B, whatever. And then I can look back and date that, take pictures, match it up with my cell phone. Um, that was just the easiest way for me to do it. And it was really easy, especially during the winter when I was trying to figure out what went well and what went poorly and what I can do next spring. It was really easy to have that notebook to look back and see what I was thinking and see what I was seeing at that time. I prefer a notebook. I like writing things down. I've met guys who do it on their cell phones. Um, they record everything in a notes app. Whatever works best for you, do that. Find what works best for you. And then finally, if you can't tell I previously taught undergraduates, I want to give you a little bit of homework. And it's not very hard homework, and it's enjoyable homework. Go out and actually walk your pastures. Walk and see how they're doing. Do you think they're overgrazed? Do you think they're underutilized? Can you be getting more out of your pastures? Or do you need to pull back a little bit? Try to identify the grasses and weeds. Uh, CSU Extension is a great resource. You can take them to your local extension office or email a picture to your local extension agent. And then develop a grazing plan. Actually write out what you want to do this year, how you're going to move your animals, how you might subdivide them. Have a plan going into it. Your plans can always be changed really easily. You can make adjustments. You can be adaptive. But it's a lot easier to figure out where you're going if you have a map to get there. And I also forgot to put a conclusion slide on there. So I am more than happy to take any questions you have and share my contact info in the chat. Thank you very much, Kat. If you have questions for Kat, now is a great time to either raise your hand or place the questions in the chat. And I will read them. Here's a question from Karen. What are the concerns with grazing and herbicide use? Uh, hi, Karen. Well, that is a complicated question. So you'll need, it will depend on what herbicide you're using. So on your herbicide label, there should be a section that will list what you're using it for. So if you're using it for pasture and rangeland, and then it will have a um, grazing interval. So there should be a time that says, uh, how many days after you've applied that product can you put animals out on to graze? And it will typically say grazing and haying, so those numbers might vary slightly. Um, a lot of times we can get a lot of really good weed control management from just our grazing strategies and working 
that way and using animals to control weeds where and when we can. Um, but herbicides can be really effective. We just need to make sure that we're keeping the animals out for that period of time listed on the label. Great, thank you, Kat. Uh, another question from Janet. How do I develop a grazing plan? Do you have any resources that I can use to help develop a grazing plan? Yes, we absolutely do, Janet. Um, so if you check out our small acreage management website, it's sam.colostate.edu. Nope, sam um, if you can tell, I <laughs> read, did this presentation last night and realized I completely left off the info slide. Um, so it's sam.extension.colostate.edu. There are a lot of fantastic resources on there that uh, discuss grazing, grazing management, and how to develop pastures, um, as well as how to measure the amount of forage you currently have in your pasture. Along with that, we do have um, small acreage management specialists. So I cover the Front Range region. I have a counterpart who covers the southern part of the state, and we are more than happy to visit with you and help you develop that. Thank you, Kat. Another question from Chris. Could overgrazing occur even if only one animal is eating the grass for a long period of time? Yes, that is definitely what we call our overgrazing and understocking situation. So a lot of times we'll drive around the front range and you'll see two horses in a big old pasture all by themselves, but that pasture looks pretty overgrazed. Um, so what's happening here is that the horses are going around and any animal can do this. I'm just picking on horses today, I'm sorry. Um, they'll go around and eat the grasses that they like best first. So they'll go around, they might move from one end of the pasture to the other, and then they'll come back to those same grasses. Now, those grasses haven't had enough time to fully regrow. They might only be little tiny sh new shoots, and those little tiny shoots are actually like candy to livestock. They will go after them because they're lush and green and delicious. So those horses might graze it once, move somewhere else, come back when it's too small, graze that plant again, and that's when we see those uh, plants and grasses being continually grazed and hit and hit and hit, so they don't have time to fully recover. And that's when we see them start to diminish, and we call that overgrazed, just because those grasses aren't able to recover, and we might see those grasses die and then just disappear out of the field. Great, thank you, Kat. That is all the time we have for questions now. So again, if you have questions, you can email them uh, to Kat or to Jonathan Reif. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kat. There's a slide, a slide that you could have used. <laughs> so um, we will uh, switch now to a um, presentation by oh, get back um, Dr. Scott Nissen from CSU. He's a weed science professor and extension specialist, and uh, he's been researching leafy spurge and he's had uh, several um, projects here and with his grad students uh, on um, Greenland open space in regards to yellow toad flax control, as did Dr. Beck. And uh, he's been uh, um, involved more uh, in research dealing with invasive species since Dr. Beck retired. So um, we will uh, proceed with, 
with his uh, video presentation, which is about 15 minutes, in regards to uh, the soil bank uh, seed issues. We are ready to play the video. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Scott Nissen from Colorado State University. The title of my presentation is Changing the Tide by Targeting the Soil Seed Bank and Preserving Intact Perennial Systems. I want to talk a little bit at the beginning about how limited our resources here are in the, in the Western US. Obviously, water is our most critical and least reliable resource. Weeds compete with uh, not only with native plants, but also with other weeds. This uh, picture here is just to demonstrate how difficult it is for plants of any kind to compete with downy brome once it's uh, well established. In the center of the picture, you can see some little tiny green plants. These are kochia that have been trying to compete with the downy brome, which obviously got established much earlier. And then on the sides of this particular plot, you can see some fairly large, robust kochia that are not competing with downy brome and doing much better. This is just an illustration of how important it is for us to uh, manage this resource uh, of water, which it being the most, uh, most unreliable. Well, part of the talking about um, the soil seed bank is that it's a really interesting way to think about how we might change the paradigm of managing certain weed species. The term soil seed bank comes from the idea that in the fall, there's going to be, or whatever time of year the plant happens to shed seed, there's going to be what's called seed rain. And in this example, money is raining down into that piggy bank there that's called the soil seed bank. That is called seed rain. And whenever uh, seeds germinate, well, that's a withdrawal from the bank. And so that's why this idea of the soil seed bank kind of caught hold when people were talking about how to manage um, weed seeds in the soil. A little bit more detailed look at how the, the soil seed bank works. This is from a publication of Montana State University. Fabian Manalid uh, put this together, and I thought it was very illustrative because it uh, talks about all the different things that can happen with weeds, weed seeds in the soil. You can see the very center there, you have weed seed raining in or seed being brought in by wind or animals or machinery from other locations to add to the soil seed bank. Once the seeds are in the soil seed bank, that doesn't mean they're all available for germination. You, you have a lot of dormant seed. In fact, there are people who spent their entire career studying seed dormancy because it would be ideal if we could somehow break the different mechanisms of seed dormancy and get all the weed seeds to germinate at one time. That would be very useful. But what this diagram shows is that there are non-dormant seeds. Those will germinate, some will establish, and add to the seed raid, some will germinate and die. The seeds can be decayed by pathogens and fun, fungi or can be predated by birds and mice and, and insects. Many of you who have had a class in weed science have probably been aware of the fact that weeds or plants in general uh, vary dramatically in how long their seeds last in the soil seed bank. This little a figure here at this table illustrates that there's tremendous variation in how long it might take to deplete the soil seed bank of a, ter of a certain weed species. Um, you can look at the top. We're all familiar with things like lamb's quarter. Uh, it may only take 12 years to get rid of 50% uh, of the seed, but to get to that 99% uh, level for a reduction of seeds in the soil seed bank, that takes 78 years. Now, if you look toward the bottom, another plant that I've already talked about, kochia. Obviously, within a half a year, you've lost 50% of the seeds in the soil seed bank because basically they're a naked seed meant to germinate uh, very rapidly. And you can get rid of 99% of all the weed seeds within two years if you were to stop any more seed rain from, from uh, occurring in that particular site. 
So how does this work for a plant like downy brome? This is an invasive annual graft symposium. So obviously you need to start talking about things like downy brome. And this is kind of going over some research that we conducted uh, here at CSU starting in like 2010, I think. It's when we initiated this particular study, but the idea was to look at how long does downy brome seed actually survive in the soil seed bank. And we had a series of treatments with anywhere from one to five applications of glyphosate to stop uh, seed production. During the course of those years, we went out and took biomass and other parameters, but at the end of the, in 2015, we went out and took soil cores. That's what the little red circles represent. We brought those, uh, cut out the soil samples with a uh, golf cup cutter, brought them into the greenhouse, um, combined all the six samples into one composite for each uh, rep of the tree of a treatment and grew them up in the greenhouse to see what was left in the soil seed bank. This figure illustrates what we found. It was not terribly surprising, but maybe one of the first times people had done this for downy brome in a natural uh, rangeland situation. And the take home message is that really um, two or three years of stopping seed production did, didn't do that much to eliminate downy brome from the soil seed bank. You can look at that three application, um, suppressed it fairly well. Um, but as soon as you stopped making that application in the fourth year, which was 2014, you can see that green line shot right back up. And by the end of the, um, of the experiment in 2015, two years later, you see that the uh, biomass is identical to what, what you find in the untreated control. The oblong circle there reminds me to state again that this at the five-year point is when we took those uh, soil cores and grew them up in the greenhouse to, to see what was left in the soil seed bank. So we had two locations uh, for this particular study. You can see from this slide that the, uh, up to three years, there's not a whole lot of difference between the untreated check and the one, two, and three-year applications of, of glyphosate to try to stop seed production. However, when we look at years four and five, we see a totally different picture. We were a little disappointed when we were looking at that fourth year because we thought by then we should start to see something. And you'll notice, especially in site two, there's some, there's a lot of green coming up there. Turns out that's actually sand drop seed and not cheatgrass. We had essentially by year four, that fourth year, we had actually depleted the soil seed bank. And so that was a very sort of interesting and exciting idea. Obviously you wouldn't wanna be spraying glyphosate for multiple years because what we found when we did that trying to make those timings in March that we essentially eliminated many of the warm, cool season grasses and the, the, the site basically became all warm season grasses. Well, we published this research in rangeland, rangeland ecology and management. So if you're interested in the details, um, you can check that out. Just wanted to throw this in here to let you know that we were doing a couple of different projects at the same time that kind of came together. And the soil seed bank um, study or information was, was pivotal into what I'm gonna start talking about now. At the same time that we were conducting the field trial with um, glyphosate to determine the um, half-life or the residual life of downy brome seeds in the soil, we also started working with um, a new herbicide that was introduced in Hawaii back in 2010. Bayer had a big uh, gathering to announce a new active ingredient, Allion. Um, the meeting, at the meeting, realized that it did have uh, listed on the label downy brome. And since it was being marketed in the vine and nut crop uh, market, it seemed that it also might be a fit in the, any kind of perennial system. So in about the same time we were doing the seed bank work, we started some of our early work with uh, Allion or in Dazaflam. And the idea being that in a perennial system, trying to control an annual weed like downy brome or Japanese brome or 
even feral rye, medusa head, any one of these uh, winter annual grasses, we may have the advantage of placement selectivity where we could uh, benefit our native perennial forbs and grasses and shrubs while controlling uh, many of these winter annual grasses. And the results were very promising. This is from some data from one of our first field trials. And it shows uh, three, five, and seven ounces of indazoflam compared to seven ounces of amazepic, roughly. And what we saw over the course of the experiment, 2016, taking these early June and August uh, pre-emergence applications, so this be three years after treatment, at the higher rates, we were getting nearly 100% uh, reduction in downy brome biomass compared to those tall gray bars, which are amazepic. And so comparing it to the industry standard, we were obviously seeing some very exciting results. Again, we're trying to get this information out so other people can utilize it in their own system. So uh, one of my former PhD students, Derek Sebastian, um, went ahead and published this as part of his PhD dissertation. And the title describes a potential new herbicide for invasive annual grass control on rangeland. And it outlined our early work with indazoflam to control downy brome. What we've seen over the course of the almost 10 years since we've started working with uh, indazoflam in its various forms, is that we've been very successful along the front range of Colorado in going into some of these highly disturbed, highly degraded systems where the predominant uh, understory is either is some sort of uh, winter annual grass, whether that be feral rye or downy brome. And with the use of this product, um, with the use of indazoflam, now rejuvra for um, use in grazed sites, we've seen a tremendous release, not only in native grasses, but in native forbs as well. And you can see the pictures of before and after. You can see the kind of response that we've gotten when we uh, eliminate uh, downy brome competition. And we see this tremendous release of, of native forbs and native grasses. So this has been very, um, very promising and has been you know, one thing we have in Colorado, a lot of states don't have, is we have open space. These are tracts of land that are purchased by cities and counties and are managed strictly for the benefit of, uh, of uh, members that live in that community. It might be hiking trails or mountain bike trails or horse trails. And, and the response that we've seen in some of these areas has been uh, pretty dramatic. And when you see these kind of responses, the native wildflowers makes uh, even those who are chemically averse, uh, pretty excited. And we've got more and more of these kind of pictures from all over the front range where we've uh, treated um, with various rates of indazoflam, trying to figure out what good tank mix partners are. We started out using Roundup for a lot of uh, dormant season applications. We're now switching over and kind of recommending either uh, Mazepic or Rimsulfuron, that would be Plateau or matrix and um or laramie i guess if you're if you want a generic version of rim sulfuron and and we're finding out especially when um we can't make that dormant season application that combinations with plateau or um say laramie or, or matrix really works extremely well and just a little idea about, this was some work that uh, Dr. Shannon Clark did for her PhD dissertation. I stole these pictures because they really uh, show very nicely what can happen and how different tech mix partners could impact the response of the native community. Got the untreated there with lots of downy brome. When we throw in, in Dazaflam with, a, with Picloram or Tordon, obviously, we, uh, we control the, the cheatgrass very effectively, but we also um, deliver a pretty serious uh, stress on the, the native forbs. And you can see we've turned this particular site into mostly just a grassland, which may not be all bad if you're, you know, if you're a livestock producer. 
But the one with the, the higher rate of endazaflam shows that not only did we control the downy brome, but we released a lot of native uh, forbs. Thing that we don't think about very much in weed science is that many of these sites that are managed for as open space are extremely important habitat for for game animals like uh, mule deer. And we have one site we worked on where we have been looking not so much me personally or even those of us at CSU, but bold, the guys in Boulder County, uh, looking at the impacts of controlling downy brome and its positive influence on on winter browse for for mule deer and this picture just shows that when you eliminate the competition for downy brome you get much more uh, leaders that would be used by foraging mule deer during the the winter months and obviously you can compare the untreated to the treated you see there's a lot more browse available for for mule deer and for wildlife habitat so that's all i I guess I'll take questions at the end and uh, look forward to hearing from people who might have questions. There's Dr. Nissen's uh, information. If you want to contact him direct or you can uh, ask a question of me right now. Jonathan, we do not have any questions at this time, so you can move to your presentation. Okay. Okay. Get to the right spot here. I don't know why it goes all the way back to the beginning. All right, I'm the a former past uh, president of uh, Colorado Meat Weed Management Association, as I alluded to earlier, I uh, also served on the state uh, Noxious Weed Advisory Committee as chair for uh, one year and um, was on the committee for two years. And also I've served uh, in my career as uh, secretary treasurer for North American Weed Management Association and uh, I'm a past president of the Colorado County Weed Supervisors Association. So I'm going to speak now briefly about revegetation, noxious weed issues. Um, so one of the first things you have to ask if you're going to reseed an area, whether it's because you've built a new building or um, for whatever purpose, um, what is there on site pre-construction? So what grasses are there right now? And what noxious weeds are there? That can make a difference on how you approach reseeding. You may need to uh, kill the weeds now with herbicides and then reseed in, in October or November um, with a, what they call a dormant seed uh, planting. So noxious weeds again are non-native aggressive plants that spread by roots and seeds. Uh, that's the non-native part is a Colorado definition. Um, when Colorado has three lists, a list which is um, rare or non-existent in Colorado that needs to be managed uh, immediately for elimination of the existing plants. B list uh, is, is managed for elimination when it's rare, like the leafy spurge I have referred to in my previous presentation, in Chafee County is elimination, but in Douglas County is control. Um, and then there are sea list weeds like uh, 
and your cheatgrass and your um, common mullein and field bindweed. Uh, this is a revegetation re study done in the University of Wyoming back in the um, late 80s, early 90s, and uh, it's completed actually in 1991. And these four grasses, uh, two of them are uh, native and two of them are, are introduced, uh, did quite well in competition, competition with leafy spurge. As a patch, they sprayed with Roundup uh, twice in 1986, um, sprayed it in June and then again in, in uh, late August, and then reseeded in October. And uh, this is uh, what the competition of the grasses did. No additional control on the leafy spurge. Um, at the uh, five-year mark, and uh, or four-year, excuse me, and so they they were seeing a dramatic reduce, reduction of leafy spurge. So grasses are extremely important, and we have four A-list noxious weeds found in Douglas County: uh, orange hawkweed, uh, myrtle spurge, purple loosestrife, and um, we have had one instance of cypress spurge. We have found 23 B-list noxious weeds in Douglas County, and 13 of those are designated uh, for eradication or elimination because of their rarity, and 10 of them are uh, common. Mowing can reduce seed numbers, but will not eliminate seed production. Um, for example, if you mow at six inches, a must thistle and diffuse knapweed will flower at four or five inches below the height of your mower deck and uh, continue to make some seed. And so leafy spurge and others are creeping perennials, so they spread by their roots. Um, but again, a competitive vegetation is essential uh, to hold the soil and to use, um, make the pro property viable and usable. So the depth of the seed is also an issue, which... Uh, some people are unaware of, especially those that have come from a um, crop situation, one half inch deep for most grasses. Uh, when you're talking to a wheat farmer, that's uh, very shallow. The new normal wheat uh, seed is uh, around three to four inches deep. Uh, the best time to seed is uh, between Halloween and tax day here in Douglas County. Um, and mowing will not, again, not control noxious weeds. You've got, in these two pictures, you've got common mullein and yellow toad flax. Uh, the common mullein came back after it was mowed. Uh, the yellow toad flax is flowering um, below the height of the mower. You will get some weed seeds, common weed seeds, in your uh, bag, unfortunately. That's just, um, right now, technologically impossible with the... Uh, machinery that we have to eliminate all weed seeds, but uh, you have to focus on um, primarily certified seed to get the best results. And revegetation can work if we plant the right mix for the site. This is a site out on um, South Lake Gulch Road where um, we tried adding uh, soil amendments along with a, a slurry to reseed it, we failed twice. And part of the reason we failed twice is this number, uh, plus or minus 10 inches annual precipitation. That's what that um, slope actually retains, if that much. And we were trying something that was capable of 16 inches, which is Douglas County's average. Well, you've got to focus on what the site is to pick the grasses that will succeed there. And these are several options that would su succeed in that kind of a situation. So what do we plan to do with the property? The size of the disturbance will dictate how much revegetation must be done and it will, uh, how much of your uh, soil men's amendments are needed. Again, because of the disturbance in lots of the areas, the, the uh, top left photo is actually the uh, redevelopment of Douglas County 
fairgrounds uh, many years ago, and they moved the soil around a lot. Soil erosion occurs naturally by flooding and by man's mismanagement, overgrazing and, and uh, not focusing on how to uh, divert uh, rainfall off of a new subdivision. Things like that cause erosion. And soil development takes thousands of years. So it's uh, a challenge that we all have to f look for and follow through on. And as uh, mentioned before, overgrazing can occur with one animal or two animals. Goats are often used in, in other areas uh, and mentioned many times for uh, weed control. Even goats, if they're not managed correctly, will overgraze. And this is, if this is on the other side of the fence, you have to control or attack the weeds on both sides. A replacement of sod and seeding requires a consideration of soil herbicide residues and, and species tolerances to the herbicides that you're using. And some people and organizations are purists and want only natives, but if there are non-natives in the adjacent uh, site, then uh, what's the purpose of, not, uh, of requiring natives? It takes longer to get them established. And uh, I was once told that uh, smooth brome is the most invasive plant in Colorado. Well, we've been planting it since the 50s, so I'm not sure if that holds uh, much water. Some areas do not need anything more than time and proper uh, herbicide timing like this location. And again, according to the uh, 2010 census, uh, the... Uh, Population is all, most all, uh, urban now. So there are many different resources for grasses and reseeding. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go over them all today. But if you have specific questions, um, we will be happy to help you. Just call or email us, and we'll take care of any details that you want to talk about. And uh, drills, just like sprayers, have to be calibrated. Um, and you want, don't want to overseed or you'll just end up wasting your time. You don't want to underseed because you want to prevent the weeds. Um, again, the, and the grasses are adjacent to the area and introduced. Uh, is there really, really any point in uh, requiring natives, especially if the, the focus of the landowner is uh, a ranchette? Uh, they probably want the most... Uh, productive grass for the least amount of time to wait. So, again, um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now, or you can uh, call or email them in, and uh, we'll uh, answer them appropriately. Hi, Jonathan. We have one question here in the chat. Where can we get an official list of the noxious plants targeted for elimination? Um, I can uh, provide that. Uh, this whole um, workshop will, has been recorded. We hope to have it available to um, the public later, and we'll have lists of, of um, various flyers in regards to each specific weed, and uh, be happy to also uh, specifically talk and visit your site and uh, let you know. But uh, Certainly, uh, I don't think that's a list I've put together officially, but I do have it, so I will put that together officially and post it on that site. Thank you, Jonathan. We have no more questions at this time, Jonathan, so. Well, thank you for attending today, and uh, thanks to all of our uh, staff for for us assisting and putting this together.